And I see that we have a quorum, and I now recognize myself for opening remarks. Let me start by thanking uh, Administrator Power for appearing before our committee today and for your leadership at USAID. And without question, your tenure has been at a time when the world is in turmoil, and to say, you know, to say just the least, but it's when your leadership is needed the most and you've delivered and continues with your, with your efficacy and with your energy and your focus uh, to get us through these uh, turbulent times. The crisis in Ukraine has only added to the critical work USAID does around the world and with nearly 6 million refugees fleeing the country and more than 8.7 million needing assistance inside of Ukraine. I was proud of the House's action, very quick action, in fact, last week, providing an additional supplemental to support the people of Ukraine and those impacted by the crises, including more than $4 billion in humanitarian aid. Putin's invasion of Ukraine has also exacerbated an already worsening food security situation around the world. The blocking of the port of Odessa has further restricted exports that could feed 400 million people, staples that countries around the world rely upon for basic food needs. And already we're seeing how the Russians' invasion, the Russian invasion, is affecting food prices, particularly in high import countries such as Egypt and Indonesia and Bangladesh. Furthermore, without the fertilizer that is usually produced and exported from the region, Crop production elsewhere is also at risk with potentially destabilizing impacts. These constraints on global food supply, combined with drought in the Horn of Africa, humanitarian crises in Yemen, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, and elsewhere, are worsening the impacts of climate change. All of these present and dire threats for vulnerable communities around the world these are issues that will affect everyone, everyone across the globe. The administration's budget includes an ambitious request for climate-related assistance, which is incredibly important to helping address the economic security, <coughs> environmental, and agricultural impacts of the climate crises. Similarly, I'm heartened by the request for nearly $4 billion in USAID-specific global health funding including for global health security and pandemic preparedness. Over, over the past year, we've seen much progress in the fight against COVID-19, with the United States providing more than 500 million vaccines around the world and supporting multilateral efforts through the Global Fund, COVAX, and others to leverage the collective strength of the global community. And as we saw last week at the President's COVID Summit. However, Without more funding, we risk squandering those gains, particularly in countries that have not yet been able to make vaccines fully, fully available and acceptable to their populations <clears throat> or have vulnerable health systems. So I look forward to hearing more about the administration's budget request for global health, including how we can work together to improve pandemic preparedness and build the capacity of countries to detect, prevent, and respond to outbreaks. We must also make sure we fully empower our development professionals to be ready to meet the tremendous challenges they are working to face. They are on the front lines working in countries with democratic backsliding, political instability, and military coups, or even just intense conflict. And thankfully, the United States has the premier developmental workforce in the world, a workforce that will be even better situated to achieve the goals of USAID as we work to improve <clears throat> diversity within its ranks, taking advantage of the tremendous talent that the United States has to offer. So I appreciate the efforts <clears throat> USAID has made in partnering with minority-serving institutions to create a more diverse pipeline into USAID's workforce. But we must also ensure that retention and advancement opportunities support diversity. This also means making sure that there is equity across hiring mechanisms, so all USAID staff have opportunities to advance and continue to serve the agency's great mission. Just as we've worked in a bipartisan manner to advance these priorities 
with the passage of the State Department authorization, I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle and the administration on a complementary effort for a assistance authorities. It is also critical that USAID improves its diversity of partners that the agency works with to implement its programs around the world. Members of this committee are very interested in how this budget request advances your initiative to increase the number of local partners and deliberately build their capacity and engagement in assistance decisions and implementation. <clears throat> so I look forward to hearing your opening remarks, uh, Administrator Power, and I now recognize uh, my friend and partner on this committee, Ranking Member McCall, uh, for his opening remarks. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome, Administrator Power, to uh, the committee to discuss uh, the agency's foreign policy and international development priorities. Uh, from the devastation in Ukraine to the continuing humanitarian crises around the world, uh, your mission is becoming more and more critically important. Um, it's imperative that Congress and the administration work together to understand these complex challenges and ensure the use of taxpayer dollars to advance U.S. foreign policy objectives is made. Um, the needs around the world are really growing, um, as well as here at home. Uh, USAID must double its efforts to ensure rigorous monitoring, vetting, and transparency that every dollar is achieving results. You and I have had a lot of uh, personal conversations, and I appreciate the time you spent talking to me about that very issue. Um, as you and I both know and everyone, the situation in Ukraine uh, continues to deteriorate. Uh, in fact, the city of Mariupol uh, fell um, just yesterday. I thought it was uh, interesting how the Prime Minister of Greece at a joint session of Congress talked about how Catherine the Great um, brought the Greek refugees from Crimea that was then taken by the Ottoman Empire to a city that they named Mariupol, which is actually a Greek name uh, city. So I think it was very timely today to hear from him. Um, but it's also uh, created a huge, extraordinary humanitarian crisis. Um, it's been inspiring, really, to see Ukraine and its neighbors open the particularly Poland, offer open arms to refugees, accepting over 3.3 million innocent Ukrainians. Uh, the chairman and I have been there. Um, the leader, Republican leader, and I went to Romania to see their efforts, uh, as well as uh, Poland again and the Ukraine border. Um, every European nation needs to contribute to supporting Ukraine, and the strong response to the refugee crisis Again, from Poland to Romania to Hungary to Moldova, which we'll be attending in, uh, shortly, uh, to Slovakia has really been critical. Uh, continued blockade of the Black Sea in the port of Odessa, uh, as you and I have talked about, could have devastating consequences on the world food supply. Ukraine is a breadbasket for the world, a third of the wheat supply globally, and the failure to be able to export those commodities will lead to starvation of millions of people around the globe. This impending food crisis will exacerbate conflict and further destabilize the fragile states that we see, particularly, uh, I think, in Africa. Uh, we must uh, act now to address this threat. As the chairman mentioned, we passed the $40 billion supplemental of both uh, lethal weapons and humanitarian aid uh, at a time when I think it is most needed. Um, but I do want to be clear, it's Vladimir Putin's actions that are pushing 40 million more people into an urgent humanitarian disaster, whether it be Ukrainian to blocking off and choking Ukraine from the Black Sea in an effort to starve them, the likes of which we haven't seen since Stalin, Ukraine, uh, starved his own people in Ukraine so many years ago. And it's really interesting to see history repeat itself and the parallels that we see to World War II. Um, our adversaries are exploiting these crises to advan advance their malign agenda and undermine the rule of law. The USA must recognize this threat and, and be more strategic in utilizing foreign aid as a key tool to counter the malign actions of both now Russia and China as they are now allies in this unholy alliance that they formed and forged at the Beijing Olympics. Uh, I continue to be concerned about China and their Belt and Road Initiative. Their debt trap diplomacy efforts are saddling developing countries with unsustainable debt 
while securing strategic investments and gaining leverage. And on that point, um, the Administrator, the idea that 20 African nations abstained from the UN Security Resolution, um, abstaining from supporting Ukraine against Mr. Putin, just shows how much of a grip the CCP has over these 20 African nations. They also use uh, their leverage to coerce countries to break diplomatic re uh, relations with Taiwan and to refrain from criticizing China's appalling human rights violations. I know you wrote a piece on genocide in your prior lifetime, I should say. Um, China recently blindsided both me and the Biden administration with a security pact with the Solomon Islands, which is particularly concerning, uh, basically buying their way in to uh, take over the very islands my father's generation liberated. These are the very uh, same islands, again, that uh, go back to World War II. Now they're under the thumb of the CCP. Um, the Biden administration's FY23 uh, budget request to undercut, I think, a deepening in, of engagement in the Indo-Pacific. And we uh, have to look at the threats not only to Europe, but to Asia as this crisis unfolds. When I meet with the partners and allies around the world, I ask why are they entering into dangerous agreements with the CCP? And they tell me because we're not there. I think we need to be on the field to win and we need to compete. And I think your agency, along with the Development Finance Corporation, which is created by this committee, has a solemn obligation in this competition, this great generational competition that we do have uh, you know, with uh, China. It's also important we help understand um, that it's American generosity, it's changing lives. And that's why, uh, with Mark Green, your predecessor's request, I implemented the Branding Modernization Act to see that United States flag. Uh, when we send food and medicine, that they know that it's coming from the United States of America for China certainly puts their flag and raises it very high. Uh, the legacy of U.S. efforts to save lives and support the development of healthy, more prosperous, more stable communities is something we all can be proud of. But we are witnessing the largest invasion in Europe since the Nazis, since World War II, since my dad's war. When we went to Poland, they said it's eerily reminiscent of 1939, and the parallels are real when Hitler invaded Poland. Um, and I really commend the Polish people uh, for the, the burden they have bared in accepting these refugees and what I think is one of the greatest examples of being a good neighbor for humanitarian purposes. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, I now turn to the chair uh, and ranking member of the International Development uh, Subcommittee for their remarks. Uh, Chairman Castro, you're now recognized for one minute. Uh, thank you, Chairman Meeks, and thank you, Administrator Power, for your important work at USAID. I look forward to hearing from you on the efforts of USAID and the state of international development today. And I hope today you will speak to the need for the United States to continue to lead on pandemic recovery, including on vaccines, treatment, and development assistance, and what we did to accomplish those goals. Efforts of mobilization are absolutely essential, and I've appreciated our partnership on the issue and hope this hearing is an opportunity for you to demonstrate progress on making our foreign assistance more effective, sustainable, and equitable by working with local partners. There's much more on innovation, climate finance, and your work in the Western Hemisphere that also merit discussion. And I look forward to working together and discussing USAID's important mission today. I yield back, Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Now, I know we would hear from Ranking Member Meliotakis, but there's a special guest in the building Prime Minister of Greece, and they just asked her to have a, a private meeting with him, so she's not here. Uh, so we'll go straight to Administrator Samantha Power, who has led the U.S. Agency for International Development for over the past year. She's someone that's not a stranger uh, to us on this committee, but she's testified before us on several occasions in different capacities over the years also. So I'm going to skip reading her extensive and dynamic biography 
uh, and you know, which is so impressive, and just go straight to the administrator. Uh, you'll have uh, time to deliver your opening remarks, and without objection, your prepared written statement will be made part of the record. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Meeks, Ranking Member McCall, uh, Representative Castro, and distinguished members of the committee. I am very grateful to be here for the opportunity to discuss the fiscal year 2023 President's uh, budget request for the U.S. Agency for International Development. I do look forward to having the chance uh, to respond to some of what you, Mr. Chairman, and you, Ranking Member McCall, and you, Representative Castro, have raised uh, in your brief opening statements. But if I could use mine uh, here to frame the broader discussion that I hope we can have over the next uh, few hours, it is no overstatement to say that right now, right here, uh, arguably just like back in 1939, we are gathering at a profound juncture in human history. For 16 straight years, we have seen the number of people living under democratic rule decline. The world is now less free and less peaceful than at any point since the end of the Cold War. And for several years, as we have seen vividly, graphically, horrifically in recent days in Ukraine, autocracies have grown increasingly brazen on the world stage, claiming that they can get things done for their people with the speed and effectiveness that they say democracies cannot match. Today we see just how empty that rhetoric is, just how dark the road to autocracy can be. From Vladimir Putin's brutal war on a peaceful neighbor in Ukraine, to the People's Republic of China's campaign of genocide and crimes against humanity in Xinjiang. Now, now, with autocracies on their back heel, is the moment for the world's democracies to unite and take a big step forward after so many years of losing ground. If the world's free nations, with the United States in the lead, are able to unite the efforts of our allies, the private sector, and our multilateral institutions, if we can marshal the resources necessary to help partner nations and freedom-loving populations, we have a chance to extend the reach of peace, prosperity, and human dignity to billions more people. This has been USAID's mission since its inception more than six decades ago, and I'm really and truly grateful to you for your continued bipartisan support of our efforts to save lives, strengthen economies, prevent fragility and conflict, promote resilience to all of these shocks, and to bolster freedom around the world. USAID's work is a testament to the fact that America cares about the plight of others, that we can competently accomplish mammoth goals that no other country can, and that the work we do abroad also matters to Americans here at home. It makes us safer, it makes us more prosperous, and it engenders goodwill that strengthens alliances and global cooperation and creates a better future for generations to come. Thanks to your past support, the U.S. has helped get more than half a billion COVID-19 vaccines to people in 115 countries. We've led life-saving humanitarian and disaster responses in 68 countries, including Haiti, Ethiopia, and Ukraine. We've helped enhance pathways for legal migration to the U.S. while working to strengthen worker protections. And we've assisted the relocation and resettlement of Afghan colleagues and refugees under the most dire of circumstances, while pivoting our programming in Afghanistan to address ongoing food insecurity and public health needs, and continuing to push to keep women and girls in school. We are also making strides to become a much more nimble agency at a time of these intense demands that you all have alluded to shoring up a depleted workforce by welcoming new recruits and operating with greater flexibility. The Biden-Harris administration's FY 2023 discretionary request of $29.4 billion will build on these steps forward, giving us the ability to invest in the people and systems to meet the world's most significant challenges so the United States can seize this moment in history. Last week, with bipartisan support, you here in the House of Representatives took a major step in that direction by passing a nearly $40 billion package for Ukraine. And we are hopeful 
for its imminent passage in the Senate. Yet the challenges we face are significant. Putin's war has displaced more than 14 million people, including two-thirds of Ukraine's children. It has led to serious disruptions uh, to global food, fuel, and fertilizer supplies around the world, further taxing the already overwhelmed international system. Up to 40 million additional people could be pushed into poverty and food insecurity in 2022 due to Putin's war. Two difficult years of the COVID-19 pandemic have set back development gains, and despite the United States' leadership in vaccinating the world, the job remains unfinished. Multi-billion dollar climate shocks appear each, more, each year with more frequency, and these challenges only compound suffering in places where there are already humanitarian crises, like Ethiopia, Syria, and Yemen. Yet as grave as these challenges are, I sincerely believe this opportunity, this moment, this point of inflection provides us uh, so much of an opportunity uh, to meet the moment and meet the needs and advance U.S. foreign policy objectives. By providing the resources necessary, the United States can galvanize commitments from our allies and our private sector partners and demonstrate to the world that democracies can deliver in a way that autocracies cannot. These actions are key to reversing years of democratic decline and creating a more stable, peaceful, prosperous future. With your support, USAID will move aggressively to grasp this opportunity to build that brighter future for us all. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Well, I want to thank you, uh, Madam Administrator. Uh, and what we're trying to work out here is to make sure that uh, we keep the hearing rolling while votes are on. And so we're just paying close attention to the votes, and we're going to try to have members go in and out. Uh, Mr. Barrow will come shortly, uh, and I'll run the vote, uh, and then I'll get back here in time for you to go to vote, and I guess you'll work the same thing out so that we can get <coughs> in. And, and the administrator has graciously said that she will be here to answer all of the members' questions, and we're going to try to move as quickly as we possibly can so that we don't run into uh, the long series of votes that I think start somewhere uh, in the area of uh, 4 o'clock. So, um, uh, I, I thank you for your testimony, and I'll now recognize myself uh, uh, for five minutes to ask questions. And when a couple of weeks ago uh, I had the opportunity to go to uh, Ukraine and I visited uh, President Zelensky in Kyiv, and one of the things that he was uh, asking and talking about uh, at that particular time was um, a Ukraine. Uh, the rebuilding, the goal of rebuilding Ukraine in a post-war scenario, both uh, infrastructurally and institutionally. So I was wondering if you were considering, considering ways uh, for USAID or for partner agencies around the world uh, to, to, to do just that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll be brief on this because I think the discussions are quite preliminary. Our uh, overriding uh, premise with regard to discussions of uh, reconstruction and the best way forward is to follow the lead of the Ukrainian authorities. They themselves, I believe it was just last week, have released a kind of notional structure, uh, internal kind of interagency structure for how those plans are being developed. I, in the last two weeks, have spoken with the Minister of uh, Social Services or Social Protection, the Minister of Agriculture, and the Minister of Health to get an early glimpse into how they are thinking about, even right now, building back better, uh, you know, not just doing temporary repairs, but, for example, in the health ministry, building back uh, health structures that have been destroyed. We know that more than 200 uh, medical facilities have been destroyed by Russian attacks how to build them back in a manner that then advances the health system from where it was before. So I think the discussions are preliminary. I will say uh, Europe has come forward and already um, uh, made very clear that they intend to dedicate uh, significant resources to this cause. So we also, of course, uh, want to leverage whatever we do to make sure that our partners uh, are contributing uh, significantly. I think that's already happening in the humanitarian and the development space. 
but reconstruction, of course, uh, given what's estimated already to be about $270 billion in uh, damages, that's going to be a very, a very yeah. significant set of investments. The fact of the matter, you know, some was talking, I don't know, I just asked this question anyways. Um, you know, I guess this is the 75th anniversary of the Marshall Plan, which helped New York to stay together. And so uh, I, I'll just ask the question, what do you, what do you think? Do you, do you have any thoughts about similarly uh, a Marshall Plan for Ukraine? Well, I think it's one tribute, and, and um, Ranking Member McCall spoke about his father and World War II. It's one tribute to <laughs> the success of the Marshall Plan uh, that the European Union is very likely, uh, again, to be driving uh, and investing, dri driving significant reconstruction efforts and making very, very significant investments. I think where we would look, uh, Mr. Chairman, as the Ukrainians develop their planning uh, is to stay in constant dialogue with you about what we might mobilize. I would note that the international financial institutions, the multilateral development banks, are going to be a big part uh, of the equation. And right now, again, our emphasis is on getting markets up and running, because with territory liberated from Russian hands, in addition to reconstruction, people are actually willing to live in really difficult circumstances just to be near their homes, their schools, in their communities. And so we need to make sure right now that we're, we're supporting them in that fashion. So but it's going to be a big job. Switch real quick because it's important. You know, there's a report that one in five women report experiencing <laughs> sexual and gender-based violence uh, in humanitarian emergencies. And sadly, we've seen that crisis around the entire world. And we must ensure that the protection services, including counseling, safe spaces for women and children, protection against gender-based violence, and reducing the risk of human trafficking are available uh, in these places, in these spaces. So can you speak to the importance of USAID's safe from the start programming to support protection for populations in places like Ukraine or Ethiopia or Afghanistan? And let me also add, uh, secondly, that this, this huge global food crisis uh, being exacerbated by Putin's war in Russia, again, will increase the likelihood of GBV for women and girls in food insecure population. And so is the administration's budget sufficient in ensuring programming with robust and and that is robust and comprehensive? And how did this funding differ from previous enacted levels? Um, well, I hope we'll have time uh, to talk at length over the course of the hearing about the, the global food crisis and the impacts uh, of Putin's war on <clears throat> very specific circumstances in different countries. But in the brief time we have left here in this exchange, let me speak, if I could, to your, the first part of your question. Since I'm the chair, you'll have a little bit longer to answer Oh, do I? Do I have longer? <laughs> okay. Uh, so then I'll take, I'll take each in turn. Um, so on sexual and gender-based violence, just to say it is um, horrific. It is, as you've described it, I, you know, again, it'll take time to get the documentary uh, record on all of this or to have processed all of the, um, uh, the complaints and all of the testimonies of, of, of women and girls who have suffered sexual violence, uh, but it is as systematic and prevalent as anything that I have seen in what is now uh, a nearly three-decade career of documenting atrocities, including rape and sexual violence as a weapon of war. Um, I think there are a couple different aspects to the response. I think one and we won't go into it here, but the war crimes and atrocity documentation, making sure uh, that that evidentiary record is built, first sent to the Commission of Investigation that was set up at the UN Human Rights Council. The ICC has said it's opening up an investigation. There's domestic prosecutions uh, where the Ukrainian uh, domestic prosecutor general uh, is b building cases and files already. All of that needs to go there. But what you focused on is so important, which is the psychosocial the trauma, the healing, the recovery. And there, uh, you mentioned some of our programming. We're also supporting uh, a hotline, an anti-trafficking hotline that was used before the war, but now, uh, unfortunately, is, is uh, seeing much more activity. Uh, just last week, I think, we trained uh, Ukrainian psychiatrists in how to deal with IDPs and these new uh, internally displaced persons and the new issues that they are reporting having uh, suffered uh, even you know as they were being displaced from their homes or, or as survivors of sexual violence. So in a sense, Mr. Chairman, it involves a combination of expanding programming that we were doing because of the prior conflict 
and because of our steady state investment in women and girls empowerment and the prevention of gender-based violence. But then as these large international organizations and others come in uh, to make sure that they have protection services as part of their mandate. So not just food, water, medicine, all of that is essential, but also that they are able to, to meet the needs of, of women and girls who've gone through these horrors. Thank you. Let me now yield to uh, the ranking member, Mr. McCall. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, on the issue of war crimes, the chairman and I uh, passed almost unanimously a war crimes bill. <clears throat> As I understand, Senate Foreign Relations will be taking that up, and hopefully will be on the president's desk uh, very soon. It's a good sign or message from the United States Congress on behalf of the American people that we view these as war crimes, and we will prosecute you. Um, and um, I was pleased to see Ukraine taking the lead just last week uh, with the individual who killed a, I believe, 63-year-old woman. Um, and, you know, the, the uh, images of the maternity hospital, the pregnant woman who died, uh, the, uh, uh, the building with children so big in Russia, you could see it from the satellites, and they bombed it to schools. Um, then the anecdotal stories we got in Poland uh, from Ukrainian women about the the raping, the torture, killing of whether it be little girls with, uh, say, the Wagner group to uh, Russian soldiers to mothers being raped in front of their families. And uh, it just goes on and on and on. And I, I believe with the dust of Mariupol settling, we're just going to hear more and see more images. And it's just horrific. And they need to be held uh, accountable for that. Um, I have two quick questions. I know we're going to have to go vote. But... Uh, the first, you and I talked about, um, and when I was over there, they, they expressed a frustration about getting this aid that we have passed in Congress actually to the conflict areas where they need it the most. I know it's a very difficult thing to do, um, but they talked, as you and I discussed as well, about using trusted partners in Ukraine that have networks and logistics. And, and I understand you need, you need certifications, you gotta deal with you know, uh, metrics, because you don't want to be back here in front of us and us, you know, grilling you on that. Uh, and so I get that drill, but what have you done to try to expand that aid into Ukraine? Thank you so much. Um, I think it's a really important question, and I think the entire international humanitarian community needs to be operating in a manner that takes account of all that Ukraine has to offer, that this is just fundamentally a very different operating environment than the kinds of places many of our traditional partners operate. So on our side, that also means uh, for our humanitarians who work for USAID and identify partners to support uh, to be thinking differently as you and I have discussed. And I really appreciate actually the language, we, we, we haven't discussed this subsequent to our phone call, the language that you all had uh, put into the supplemental that stresses the importance of not only working with international but also local organizations. So I think that's an important signal. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but for now, uh, first, it's important to note that the international humanitarian organizations like World Food Program offer a lot. They offer scale. Uh, and they've already set up, I think, more than seven uh, hubs, seven warehouses uh, uh, in, inside Ukraine proper. Uh, this is a dramatic increase, of course, because they were not even really operating in Ukraine before this phase of Russia's long uh, war that began in 2014. This, this horrific phase began. So that those startup costs were real. I think they were a little slow uh, at the beginning because they weren't there, and, and now they've staffed up. And, and I think the numbers that they're reaching, which is close to 4 million, is reflective of that. They are also working with uh, 200 organizations themselves as partners, and so a very significant share of them are local. Of those organizations, are local organizations. Second, uh, we have just last week finalized an agreement with uh, an international NGO, uh, basically to to oversee a consortium of local organizations, and that'll be about 120 million dollars. Not the kind of scale of resource we invest in the World Food Programs or the UNICEFs. Uh, but I think these organizations uh, will have lower overhead. They will reach parts of the countries that the international organizations are not yet present, and I think you'll start to see a real return on that. There are also organizations, last thing I'll say just quickly, because I know they have such a, 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 a constituency up here, organizations like World Central Kitchen, we are, even though we are not funding them at the moment, they are such a visible manifestation in, in the spirit of your, your branding initiative, sir, 
of the American people's generosity, we are looking uh, forward and thinking through, in addition to all of the support they're getting from the private sector, is there more that we can do to partner with them? For example, as we work with the Ukrainian Minister of Agriculture in our traditional development lane, is there a way to work with an organization like World Central Kitchen as they now move into the business of actually trying to get seeds to farmers for the next planting season? If I could just close, my time is going to expire. Uh, and thank you for that. I, I also uh, I met with uh, David Beasley, and I've dealt with him a lot. He has a lot of credibility on the Hill on both sides of the aisle in the World Food Program. So I'm glad to hear you uh, invoke uh, that organization. Also, um, he, uh, he emphasized to me with the closing of Odessa, and really, uh, all the entire um, of Ukraine imports to the Black Sea in an effort to choke off Ukraine and starve them. They can't export their wheat. So when we were in Romania, for instance, we were trying to find a way they could truck, because the gauges don't work on the railroad, to truck it to Romania, to the NATO port we were at, visited. And then the Russians bombed the railroad bridge to stop that. And um, I just worry, and I know my time's expired, but you know, perhaps you and I can talk talk offline, what is this going to mean in terms of uh, global food uh, shortage and supply, uh, particularly in African nations like in Egypt? Uh, what is it going to mean for the world? And I think you're going to see famine and you're going to see instability as a result of that. When people say, why is Ukraine important? That's why it's important. It's also important because President Xi's looking at Taiwan. That's important to me and our foreign nation adversaries. It's also important because of energy. But it's also important because a third of the global wheat supply comes out of there. And so um, I know my time's expired, but uh, would love to get your um, take on that as well. Great, thanks. The oh, they gentleman's should. time has expired. Um, let me go ahead and recognize myself for, for five minutes of questions. Um, we are rightfully so talking a lot about um, how Putin's invasion of Ukraine has disrupted um, global food, food supplies. Prior to the invasion, though, we knew we had a massive food insecurity, water insecurity crisis in the world, and, and we will post-invasion. And yeah, I know USAID um, has been focused on you know, feed the future and, and, and real investments here, but I do worry with increased, um, with climate change, a warmer planet, you know, um, the massive displacements of, of individuals um, are going to continue to impact these fragile states. So a couple questions. Um, my home institutions, the University of California, Davis, and the, um, they benefit from being one of the 21 innovation labs that um, USAID partners with in, in terms of academias. I'd be curious, um, one, how the administration's budget is looking at utilizing the expertise that our academia has and, and universities like UC Davis. And then a second area that I've been spending a little bit of time delving into is um, alternative proteins and, and some of what's happening in that space in terms of taking um, you know, bio waste and, and so forth, fermenting it and so forth. And thinking about right now the technologies aren't at a, a price point where you can go into Africa and you know, work with communities, but I think that is all coming because investments going into some of the alternative protein, alternative food spaces. Potentially, you know, the reduction in water utilization, the ability to take, you know, um, bio waste and turn that into um, into food, um, and the the reduction in the amount of water that you have to use. And I'd be curious if this is a space that um, USAID is looking at partnering with academia, but also funding programs abroad. Thank you, Congressman. Um, I, let me say say a few things and maybe on the very specific um, question of uh, adjustments that are being made in our programming uh, as it relates, again, to a greater emphasis on bio-waste. Maybe I could just get back to you on the, on the specifics on that. Uh, but first, I, I, you, just to come back to the premise of your question, which is so important, which is there was a food and even imminent famine crisis before Putin's invasion of Ukraine. And I think that uh, it's developing countries say that to us a lot. Um, I last week met with the ministers of agriculture, permanent secret secretaries of agriculture for uh, Kenya, uh, Zambia, and Tanzania. 
Um, and, you know, we are in the scrum with them just trying to figure out, okay, what are the adjustments we can make if we already have a Feed the Future program on the ground? Um, now, with the supplemental potentially uh, securing imminent passage, it gives us the opportunity to work side by side with them and allow their own country planning and their articulation of urgent needs uh, to help us uh, work with others in the interagency to figure out if, again, if, it, if Senate willing, uh, you know, how that additional $760 million in, in food security resources could be spent. And that's, again, built on top of our Feed the Future programming. I think Feed the Future's investments in those research organizations are key. I will say there's usually a little bit of a lag between what you hatch, uh, you know, in a, in a university lab room and what you're able to get into the capillaries of the international system. It goes without saying. Um, but already, you know, on issues like um, precision targeting of the fertilizer that is out there, we know that Russia and, and Belarus contribute 40% of the world's fertilizer, export 40% of the world's fer fertilizer. That's a problem. There was a problem before the invasion insofar as supply chains were screwing up the export of, of, of those fertilizers uh, in any event. But working, for example, I heard today about a program in Ethiopia where we have managed um, to work with farmers in select areas to get 80% more uh, grain out of the fertilizer that they are using. It turns out there's just an, a lot of inefficient use of fertilizer uh, in countries that have had adequate supply in the past. Well, now when there isn't adequate supply, that has to be uh, the learning there and, the, the again, the targeting of that fertilizer and the efficient use of that fertilizer has to be uh, accelerated. I think the organics are great supplements. Um, nobody wants to be uh, dependent for fertilizer on single sources, and I think export vulnerability has been exposed in this crisis, just as it was in different domains uh, during the pandemic. Uh, but, you know, thinking through what the right diversified uh, portfolio, you might say, of fertilizer is for any country, which might include, you know, compost uh, or, or manure or something in the moment, but ultimately is going to need the scale of uh, chemical fertilizers as well. Great. And I notice my time's expired, so let me recognize my good friend, the gentleman from Ohio, the ranking member on the subcommittee on Asia and the Pacific, Mr. Shabbat. Thank you Bye. very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, let me apologize, Madam Administrator, for members going in and out of here. As you know, we've got votes going on on the floor. Some of us have meetings out in the hallway at the same time, so it's been a bit chaotic. So I apologize for coming and going myself as well. Um, the U.S. Uh, is, I think we all know, the most generous um, donor nation on, on the globe, uh, contributing hundreds of millions of dollars uh, really billions probably to many causes, uh, hopefully with the goal to make the world uh, a better, more stable place. Unfortunately, um, the world is probably becoming even more dangerous, as I think you mentioned in, in your testimony, in your opening statement, and our share of global GDP is decreasing. So in the future, we aren't likely going to be able to continue to cover as much ground as we used to, at least uh, financially, uh, relative to giving aid, that sort of thing. Um, can you give me some examples of discussions that the administration, you or others uh, in, in your capacity have had uh, with either our allies or our partners on sharing uh, that burden and some examples where other countries uh, have have picked up the slack? Um, Congressman, it's such an important question. It's something also that really hits home with me because uh, in my prior life, I was UN ambassador and spent m much of my day, every day, uh, trying to leverage what we did to catalyze contributions from others. Um, let me give you a couple uh, positive examples. Um, uh, Germany, we, we were, I had an exchange uh, a minute ago with, with uh, Ranking Member McCall about the World Food Program, which I think has a lot of uh, support up here on the Hill, rightly. Uh, Germany, back in 2012, uh, contributed $150 million annually to World Food Program. Today, that number is $1.4 billion. Uh, They're also, of course, making contributions through uh, the European Union uh, as well. It's complicated for European countries because they have to, uh, they, they give bilaterally, but also give uh, through their European Union share. That's one example. I would say that um, while much is made of China's investments in the international system through the Belt and Road Initiative, much 
uh, the, uh, you know, that, that, that the challenges associated with that in terms of debt traps, uh, the lengthy uh, uh, and, and often um, uh, the, the inadequate oversight, the inadequate environmental protections, all the rest, but a lot of money spent in developing countries, not a lot of investments commensurate to growth in GDP in international institutions, uh, apart from where there's an assessed contribution where it's automatic in terms of GDP and GNI. Th thank so, you. Let me, if I could just please. stop there, because I've only got two more minutes ago. I wanted to get another question. And sure. I appreciate your response. And, um, you know, relative to China and the Belt and Road Initiative, I think, you know, we all know, and as you mentioned, the debt trap, um, many countries, uh, you know, end up signing on to something they probably didn't at the beginning really understand what they were getting into. Uh, you know, Sri Lanka and a whole lot of others uh, are, are examples of, of just that and end up, uh, China ends up uh, being advantaged to the disadvantage of the other, other country. And we need country, you know, the countries in the Gulf states, as we know, are uh, quite wealthy, uh, do do, you know, some good. They help in, in different areas, but they need to step up. Uh, Japan has been pretty good over the years in contributing to various causes, but the United States has limited resources and a lot of problems of our own, so we need to, other countries to step in as well. Um, finally, the U.S. spends a lot of money we don't have on things that uh, unfortunately don't necessarily have to do with our national interests. So um, I have a question. Can, can you identify for me some programs that USAID uh, looked uh, at this year and maybe said that program is nice, might, might even... Uh, help some people, but it isn't uh, clearly connected to U.S. security interests, our national security interests, so uh, we just can't afford uh, to fund it anymore. Thank you. Uh, just parenthetically, on the Ukraine uh, development, humanitarian economic assistance, that large pie yep. of what people have contributed right now, this is to your prior question, I'll come to the, the question you just posed. Uh, U.S. share so far, despite all the generosity and the uh, the resources that we've expended is 11 percent of the overall international contribution to the crisis in Ukraine right now. So that's okay. it, that kind of ratio, of course, would be nice to sustain, but agree very much on the Gulf countries. Um, I think with regard, I mean, first thing that uh, I, I would <laughs> use your second question to, to underscore is that we are massively earmarked. When I entered the agency in terms of our development assistance, uh, 96 percent of our assistance was uh, earmarked uh, by, uh, by region or by geography and by sector, leaving us very little flexibility to make that kind of, to step back and, and make the kind of allocations uh, that, that you are describing. Um, I, you know, I think that in every country where we work, I'll give you an example, um, in Central America, Northern Central America, as we've seen corruption revelations now from Guatemala, El Salvador, et cetera, we've just cut off funding to, for example, the Supreme Court, uh, the Attorney General's office, to those bodies we were working with, thinking that we could make progress on the rule of law. But once we saw the rule of law itself being violated uh, by those institutions, we stopped those programs and actually began to channel uh, some of that funding to independent media and civil society organizations who are watchdogs of those institutions themselves. So that's one example. I'm happy to follow up with you right. with other examples. Thank you very much. My time's expired. Go back. Thank you. Let me go ahead and recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Smith, the ranking member on the Subcommittee of Africa, Global Health and Global Human Rights. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Administrator Power. Again, welcome back to the committee and thank you uh, for your service. Um, just on the issue of human trafficking, um, especially now as it relates to the Ukraine uh, and surrounding areas. Uh, at least three or four times a week, I'm in touch with people who are on the ground. I've been part of hearings uh, as the special representative for the OSCEPA uh, for human trafficking. I'm talking to ODIR and all the others that are involved in this. Um, and there's obviously a serious exploding problem that I believe is only going to get worse. Um, you know, the vulnerability of women and children uh, you know, when they, some of them come across the border, uh, they have some resources, they quickly spend down those resources, and now uh, we're in a window where uh, they're at even graver risk uh, of deception and exploitation. So my question is, with existing funds, could you give us a sense as to what you're doing now? Uh, and with the almost near certainty that you'll get about $4.3 when the $40 billion is approved by the Senate, maybe as early as 
hope should have been done already, but by, say, Thursday. Uh, I know you're planning, and you know, you'll get back to us, I'm sure, within 30 days with what you're doing, but there's got to be some very aggressive planning going on on how to mitigate this harm, uh, especially to women and children. And secondly, uh, if I could, as I, you might recall, I was the prime author of the Iraq and Syria Genocide Relief and Accountability Act of 2018. Uh, and after chairing seven hearings on the lack of response to those fleeing ISIS, particularly the Chaldean uh, Church and the Yazidis, uh, this is years ago, of course, uh, the, the money was then provided, and we also established in the uh, bill uh, the new partnership, partnership initiative. I'm wondering how that is being uh, implemented. And if you could, for the committee, explain why Iraq's persecuted Christian community in the Nineveh Plain was dropped from the USAID OTI Iraq Resilience Project in October of 2021. Uh, the Nineveh Plain, also traditionally home to a, a number of Yazidi uh, uh, individuals, was the only geographic area dropped, meaning, uh, and, and I found it puzzling and mind boggling. Uh, I have been there, to, particularly uh, to visiting with the uh, Christians who fled ISIS, and if you could give us an insight into that, and hopefully, uh, the concern is that those communities be be supported. Thank you, uh, Congressman. I'm going to have to get back to you, uh, if I could, on your last question uh, in terms of you know being uh, th this group being dropped from a specific program. I, I've just got to get back. I'm happy to do it by phone Please do. and not at the staff level. I know how important um, uh, the issue of religious protection, religious freedom. Uh, you know, have long been to you and certainly are to me. So, so let me look into that um, and the larger Iraqi funding questions that you're, you're referencing. Um, if I could speak to the protection crisis, the exploding protection crisis that you're describing. Um, first, USAID on human trafficking over the last 20 years, as I understand it, has spent about $340 million in programming, a lot of that leadership and perhaps some of those earmarks. Um, and directives have, have come from you, but this is incredibly uh, important programming. However, this is a new crisis that creates new challenges that requires new structures. And I think that um, we all know, and many of us, again, have visited uh, the border uh, countries. I visited Slovakia, Moldova, and Poland a couple times uh, since February 24th. Um, you know, when 95% of the people coming across the border are women and children, a lot of generosity, families showing up at the uh, at the border crossing saying, let me take you, but also some very, very unsavory uh, characters. I think it took time, frankly, for Europe, particularly those countries that are members of the EU, uh, to bring additional resources to bear to support border guards who weren't accustomed to this uh, kind of um, uh, flood of, of individuals, vulnerable individuals. Um, I think we, USAID and PRM is at the State Department, of course, funds the refugee assistance uh, part of our portfolio. Uh, but USAID within Ukraine, we have uh, spent of the, uh, you know, roughly $400 million um, on food, medicine, water, uh, repair, uh, sh shelter and the like, uh, about tw base, uh, around $25 million on protection assistance. But in some ways, just focusing on the humanitarian, uh, and that would go to organizations like UNICEF and others who are setting up uh, you know, programs and shelters and the like for, for internally displaced, because that is USAID's uh, jurisdiction here. Um, but through our development assistance, you know, we are training Ukrainian uh, psychi psychiatrists and psychologists about uh, how to talk to w women and girls who've experienced something like human trafficking or just displacement and the ravages of displacement. Uh, we have set up a hotline uh, inside Ukraine and spent a good degree of development resources. I get you this specific number. It, it doesn't do you any good to have a hotline if nobody knows what the number is. Uh, so uh, actually creating PSAs and ensuring that things, advertisements for that number arrive on people's cell phones or that they can see billboards, pamphlets, and the like. So the infrastructure was there before the war. We had made uh, investments in the fight against human trafficking. But now we just need to scale them to an extent that, that again, was not contemplated before. Combining our traditional programs and using those structures and those uh, partners that we have long worked with, uh, but with the generous infusion of assistance, not just the 4.3 billion that you rightly pointed to, but also in our development programming that's about strengthening Ukraine's capacity 
uh, also to deal with this, which is a, uh, an issue well beyond this conflict, even if, as you say, it has exploded during this conflict. Thank you. Look forward to following up. Great. Absolutely. Let me now recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson, the ranking member on the Subcommittee on Middle East, North Africa, and Global Counterterrorism. Hey, thank you, Congressman Berra, and uh, Madam Administrator, Madam uh, Ambassador, uh, thank you so much for your service. The, the United States Agency of International Development, uh, Congressman Steve Chabot is correct. Uh, it, it actually reemphasizes the generosity of the American people, which is unparalleled in world history. And then your service is so important because I've seen it firsthand. I've had the opportunity to uh, visit at Tacloban, uh, Philippines, uh, the recovery efforts from a super typhoon. I've been to Mozaferabad, Pakistan, to see the recovery efforts of an earthquake to provide a U.S. Marine uh, field hospital for uh, females. Uh, I've seen the refugee camps. Uh, in Jordan, uh, Sudan, uh, and then I'm really grateful in uh, visiting villages in Guatemala, the extraordinary efforts that you perform along with the World Food Program uh, with Governor David Beasley. So over and over again, what you're doing is so important. And then um, also, uh, it was so inspiring to me every time I went to Afghanistan to see the schools being built for girls, the uh, bridges, the um, improvements of life. Uh, and it's just so sad to me that that has uh, now been abandoned and uh, the people are left behind. But with that in mind, uh, looking to the future, and sadly with uh, Putin's war, uh, we have uh, the legal occupation of sovereign Ukraine, and we witnessed the proliferation of disinformation uh, from uh, Putin. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate uh, very much uh, Chairman Greg Meeks, uh, Ranking Member uh, Greg McCall, the most uh, recent um, aid package, the largest aid package in the history, as I'm aware of, almost in the world. And what a message that sends to the people of Ukraine, what that message sends to Putin, and hopefully a message uh, to the people of Russia that um, th this is a uh, futile effort, which is uh, only to benefit Putin with oil, money, and uh, power. But with that in mind, what is uh, USAID doing to um, counteract the disinformation? And are there any specific programs to help uh, our allies of Moldova and Georgia? Uh, thank you so much. Um, so in, in short, uh, the first Ukrainian supplemental, and we'll have to work through the details of what we will do if we are so fortunate uh, uh, for the Senate to pass the second supplemental, but on the first, we have allocated uh, about $230 million and, and that's not only to counter disinformation, but that's a big, uh, a big part of what we are going to be doing. And again, bear in mind, and I can get you the exact numbers, but prior to the Russian invasion, uh, disinformation, the fight against disinformation, but also critically, the growth and support for Ukraine's independent media was a absolutely critical uh, component of our so-called social resilience uh, programming. So now what we have sought to do is to scale that support. Sometimes, Congressman, it entails providing flak jackets and helmets to independent journalists via our program OTI so that they continue to be out in the field, able to themselves document what's true. Uh, there's a center for uh, media and disinformation that is actually uh, government um, uh, affiliated and, and actually a number of independent journalists left civil society and went to work for this Center for Combating Disinformation. I'll get you the exact title of it. That is something that we have increased support for as the government seeks to react in real time uh, to memes as they develop, whether on Telegram or uh, on Twitter or on uh, Russian-backed television. So um, uh, again, some of it is helping those who are already doing this work manage the displacement and the crisis so that they can continue their work but many others are getting into this line of work who were performing other jobs that are deemed less of a priority in wartime. Um, the other thing I'd say- Thank you, you, thank you for your oh, efforts. Sorry. I need to get one more question Please. in. Of um, course, of course. I don't mean to interrupt, but hey, the, the people of Tunisia have been such an inspiration. They were the founders of the, uh, of the Arab Spring, uh, but sadly, uh, the current regime is backsliding. What's being done in particular with Millennium Challenge to assist the people of Tunisia? 
Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman. Just briefly, just to say in Moldova, we are increasing funding as well for our uh, disinformation work. Uh, about half the people of Moldova right now uh, have uh, show themselves to be very influenced by Russian TV in particular, and, and that's reflected in the public opinion on the war in, in very disturbing ways. Um, as it relates uh, to Tunisia, I would just say that the 23 budget requests that I'm up here um, uh, to talk about today uh, unfortunately, has in in the in the request uh, a, a lower sum uh, for Tunisia uh, because of the disappointing turns uh, by the current government, the crackdown on civil society, the move away from uh, the rule of law and from democratic institutions. We would look forward, of course, to restarting and re and, and and finding a way to get that assistance uh, going again if the government would. Uh, get the country back on a democratic uh, path. Um, so mainly our support is for civil society, media, uh, and looking at the independent electoral board, which we have long sought to strengthen and we thought was doing very important work, uh, but now have to look to see what the membership of that board will be. On the MCC, um, I, I would have to get back to you on that specifically, but given the governance circumstances in Tunisia, that's going to affect uh, the, the indicators uh, which, which are so important to, to uh, the question of whether MCC makes its, its investments. Thank you so much for your service. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Administrator Power. Uh, seeing... Uh, no one else I will now recognize. Um, oh, yes, I recognize myself, yes. <laughs> I'm just uh, joining the flow here. And, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, let, me, let me just start with a brief comment. I, I, I noted your exchange with uh, Ranking Member McCall about uh, Ukraine reconstruction with Chairman Meeks as well. Um, just note that th this extraordinarily expensive uh, enterprise, uh, I, as I think we, we agree now, could very well be aided uh, if we, we found a way with our allies to be able to make use of some of the frozen and blocked Russian assets, uh, whether we're talking about yachts or even central bank assets. I uh, asked uh, Secretary Blinken when he was sitting there a couple of weeks ago whether uh, the central bank assets were something the administration would be looking at, and he said yes. Um, I do want to note that the administration gave us uh, a legislative proposal to enable this very late in our process uh, for considering the Ukraine supplemental. That's a problem because um, it's kind of hard to pass things in the other body as standalone bills. So if we're late in getting it into the supplemental, we do have a problem. Um, we're going to need really high level administration engagement working with our leadership to find a way to get this done. Otherwise, we're probably going to be looking at no action until maybe the NDAA at the end of the year. So just wanted to note that for you. A um, couple of other things I wanted to ask about. Uh, COVID uh, vaccination, global vaccination efforts. Um, do you think it would be better for the United States to spend a few, a few billion dollars uh, beating this disease in the developing world or a few trillion dollars beating it once again in the United States? That's a loaded question. Is but that a trick question? Um, I, I, I think the best way for me to answer that question other than to say, yes, it would be better, uh, is to just note that what we are doing is working. It is working so powerfully. Um, it is working in terms of public opinion polling where our global vaccination drive is having analogous effects to what PEPFAR did uh, for America's standing uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and beyond. It is working in the sense that when President Biden held his last COVID summit back in September, 13% uh, of uh, lower middle income countries uh, were the populations, 13% of the populations were vaccinated. That number is now 52% in lower middle income countries. In low-income countries, of course, where uh, the issues really have arisen, the numbers have gone from September 1%, roughly, to around 13%. And I could give you country-by-country country, uh, breakdowns. Uh, just Cote d'Ivoire, where we launched GlobalVax to support the delivery, not just the delivery of vaccines, but the delivery into the arms of people who are looking for vaccines. Uh, the number of people who were fully vaccinated in December when we launched this was 15%. 
of this is of eligible uh, members of the population, now it is up to 38% of adults fully vaccinated in Cote d'Ivoire because of U.S. investments. What does that mean? That means in Cote d'Ivoire, the, the risk of new variants uh, getting started there is substantially lower than it would have been uh, before right. we fought. But we're running out of money. We are, have obligated almost all of our American Rescue Plan funds. We have purchased vaccines and now risk not having the ability to actually fund getting those vaccines into arms. And for all of us who care about waste, the idea of having uh, gold standard Pfizer vaccines go to waste because we can't afford to, to uh, support health workers who are working overtime or a pop-up clinic or a, a, a fight against disinformation, it is it, it would be really uh, devastating for U.S. interests, the interests of the health of our own people if we let uh, these programs um, and grind of, to a halt. And of course, there is another country with less effective vaccines waiting in the wings. As it happens, there there is. And and we, we though, with our the countries that we are working, which is all of the countries that are struggling to get their vaccination rates up, they are very clear about what vaccine uh, and, and what vaccines they would wish uh, to distribute to their populations. We just need the resources to be able to get those shots in arms, and it is a bargain. Uh, it, it is a, a really modest sum of money when you think about all the money that is spent uh, domestically, rightly, vaccinating our public, uh, ensuring, uh, b being able to take care of tests um, out of people's insurance and so forth. The least we can do is everything we can globally to make sure that another new variant doesn't come and set back the progress that we are making trying to return to a, uh, or to get to a post-pandemic America. Well, thank you. I, I would say it's the, I think it's the greatest opportunity for American leadership since the end of the Cold War. We've done a lot, we haven't done enough. It would be absolute travesty if we allowed um, China to step in because the United States Congress is unwilling to spend a few billion dollars um, to do something that saves us trillions of dollars in terms of our own economy and the global economy. Um, with that, uh, I, I uh, will call upon Representative Scott Perry of Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador, thank you for being here. Forgive me for using the way back machine here, but there's something that's kind of sticking with me that I don't ever got answers on that I'm just curious about. So this goes back a ways. October 13th, 2017, you were asked by the ranking member of HIPSI um, regarding the unmasking of General Flynn. And I think you replied that, um, that you, don't, you didn't recall unmasking him. Since that time, a lot of, obviously a lot of time has elapsed. Do, do you seek to correct that at all? Only from the context that from our records here, you unmasked him seven times in a little over a month and a half period of time. And the fact that you didn't recall that just strikes me as odd. I was uh, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, right. worked around the clock to advance U.S. interests, read intelligence in sure. order to prepare myself for negotiations with, for example, the PRC, the Russian Federation, uh, other actors in the U.N. system uh, that sought to accrue advantage for their national sure. interests. Right. And I did absolutely nothing other than advance the interests of the American people. I'm, I'm not saying you did. I'm just asking I'm seven, not going to seven discuss, times. You don't remember it all. I'm absolutely not going to discuss intelligence. Uh, I'm not asking you to discuss intelligence. I'm asking you to discuss. You are, you are absolutely asking. No, I'm asking to you to discuss whether you remember, because you said you didn't recall. It says, I don't recall making such requests, but yet you unmasked. General Flynn seven times in about a month and a half from November 30th to 11 January. So that's about a little less than a month and a half. And I'm just think, trying to clarify yeah. whether you remember now or you still don't remember ever doing that. I think it'd be helpful. I'm not sure if you've had the chance to be briefed by the intelligence community about the process by which uh, individuals who are members of the executive branch and mm -hmm. I believe the legislative branch uh, review intelligence, reveal intelligence, the question of how, for example, the identity of U.S. citizens that appear in intelligence get right. disclosed. I, I, I am it familiar. Is not, it is not a principle. So, uh, it, may I finish, sir? Yes, ma'am. It is not an official in the executive branch who ever unmasks anybody. All the official in the executive branch does is read intelligence, poses questions if there are questions that the intelligence demands, 
So any questions you have about unmasking should be referred no, to the people uh, who actually unmasked. I'm not asking about the intelligence. I'm just asking you what you did. I'm right. just asking am, you what you did. I am telling you, I am not going to discuss intelligence that I read. And, in and, and I'm not asking you to, for the record, but I am asking you about the unmasking. And I'm just wondering, so you saw some intelligence, uh, however it came to you, with one side of it that then includes an American on the other side. That makes sense. What do you learn? Like, what's the purpose of learning who asked the question or who was involved in the conversation on the American side? I'm not going to refer to any specific piece of intelligence. I'm not asking I you will to. Say, no, J no. Just tell me generally. I will, yeah, exactly. Okay. I will say generally that when one reads intelligence, uh, questions may arise where it is important to understand what it is that it is on the page. And in the event there is something that you are reading that you cannot understand, uh, where you literally cannot understand the, the, the content of what you are reading that you think might be important to do your job, only to do your job, not because of anything to do with anything other than representing U.S. interests, in my case, at the United Nations, occasionally you pose a question to the intelligence community in order to understand the intelligence you are reading. Okay, so there is no straight motive. <laughs> there is I'm, no well, ulterior anything. It is a and desire I'm confused, to understand Mr. what you are reading. Mr. Perry, I want to let you know this is a HVAC hearing, no, no, I understand, not Mr. a HIPSI hearing. I understand. And this hearing, the purpose of this hearing is for the budget questions in dealing with uh, uh, USAID. So I want to make sure that your questions are relevant to the issues of which this hearing has been called for. And it sounds to me from just walking in and listening that we are at a HIPSI hearing. We're not at, this I'm trying not. to understand why she needed to know the name and, and she, that she didn't remember seven times in a month and a half period of time unmasking the person. These questions, in my opinion, Mr. Chairman, have never been adequately answered. And this is the first opportunity I've had to ask these questions. I'm happy to ask questions about budget as well, but I've got five minutes and these are questions that are, are pressing and have been for some time. Right. And it should be pressed in the appropriate committee at the appropriate time of subject matter that that committee is hearing. So if you're not a member of said committee, you never have an opportunity to represent the folks back home that, that, you, that, are, that, that are your bosses to ask the question that they wish to ask. That's, that's the position of the committee? The committee is that we want to make sure that we are dealing with the relevant subject matters of which this hearing was called in which the witnesses were asked to testify. Mr. Chairman, the ambassador was the ambassador to the United Nations. She's here talking about USAID. This is the Foreign Affairs Committee. All these things are relevant, whether, whether or not you're interested. Look, I, you know I respect you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I get that this is an uncomfortable line of questioning, but the fact that it's uncomfortable nonetheless doesn't mean that we shouldn't endeavor to ask the questions. That, that's my job here, and quite honestly, I've sat through many, many hearings where folks on your side of the aisle asked all kinds of things that were completely irrelevant, and we allowed them to do it every single time. And that's how this goes. And you know, this is your committee, Mr. Chairman. If you want to shut me up, I just okay, it's on the record, but these are, these are germane questions to foreign affairs, and that's this committee. I respect you too, Mr. Perry. Uh, and generally, I, I let you go as you know, we only had 30 question. seconds left, Mr. Chairman. I know, but I just want to make sure that we understood the subject matter of which we were here and to make sure that we're I, I do understand, Mr. Chairman, and, and I will tell you this, too, and, and I'm not accusing the ambassador of this, but there are many times that I send correspondence to the administration and I never get an answer. So this is my opportunity. And I'm not saying that she's responsible for any of the other folks in the administration, but this is my opportunity to speak on behalf of my bosses, my constituents, and, and I feel like it shouldn't be hampered or encumbered by different opinions here, with all due respect. Always treat you with respect, as I will always treat you with respect. And I appreciate it. So do I have 30 seconds or are we done? Well, I'm going to give you 30 seconds if you have a budget question. I have a question on the same line that I had before. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Point of order, Mr. Budget. Chairman. I think it was actually at a minute, Mr. Chairman. No, he had 30 seconds at the time that I intervened. I, I won't argue it. Yeah. All right. It was, All right. At, it was at a minute. Mr. Chairman, I, I'll you. Thank you, Mr. Perry. And I recognize Representative Bill Keating of Massachusetts, who's the chair of the Subcommittee on Europe, Energy, and the Environment and Cyber for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
thank you, Administrator, for being here. Uh, thank your husband as well for his service in, in our district here. They're very helpful. Um, you know, uh, I know this has been touched on before, but it can't be touched on enough. Uh, in my view, there's going to be more, many more by multiple amounts of people that die from starvation and hunger this fall uh, because of uh, Putin's action uh, in Russia and what's, what's occurred to the uh, bread basket, what's occurred where Belarus and Russia have 40 percent of the world's fertilizer. Um, so you've addressed that, but there's one aspect I was wondering if we could do things to uh, address looking forward to this uh, awful crisis that's going to occur. And that's the issue of hoarding, too, by some countries. I noticed that India has just stopped all its exports at this stage, uh, and that's a problem. Are there things we can do to uh, try and ease what could well be the hoarding of food supplies uh, instead of equitably spreading them around given the crisis we're going to face? Thank you. Well, I know that um, Secretary Blinken and his um, legion of diplomats are out in the world and have been since the very beginning of the crisis because this is obvi an obvious uh, risk as soon as uh, Russia began to um, blockade the southern ports of Ukraine, in particular uh, blocking the export of uh, a third of the world's uh, grains, um, a third of the world's wheat, I should say. Um, and we are, you know, there, there have been a number of countries that have made decisions along the lines of India's. I would note that uh, India's uh, deal that they had, the government's deal that they had done with the World Food Program uh, to give the World Food Program significant access uh, to, their, to their grains, I believe, is still going forward. I also think there's a humanitarian assistance exception to what India has announced, but Indonesia as well has followed suit just in the last week. So. Again, uh, we are uh, urging countries uh, to think in terms of the collective good. Often it's a, an emotional or domestic political reaction, not one actually even born of uh, sound economic practice from the standpoint of feeding one's own people. Um, but in addition to uh, doing this diplomacy and urging our colleagues in international institutions like the WTO uh, and the multilateral development banks to do the same, you know, we're also just working with countries who may be in a position, not tomorrow, but in the coming months, to be able to plant more, uh, bring more uh, wheat to export. I was just talking to the Zambian Minister of Agriculture, who believes that they could be in a position with some more inputs, potentially, to do that. And so this assistance that is pending now before uh, the Senate, and we hope will be passed, maybe even while we're sitting here, um, you know, the resources there that would allow us uh, to work with countries to see what share of the supplies that are being uh, held back by Putin's war uh, could somehow be compensated for, or what share of those supplies that aren't well, going to market. Thank you. I think it also underscores bans. the need for planning. If you look at a country like Ethiopia, they won't be hurt as badly because they put a process in place. Uh, just quickly on another subject, too, I just got back from Poland. Uh, where I spoke to uh, President Duda uh, just a week before I spoke to the mayor of Warsaw. And I, and I think the same can be said for other countries in the region, but they're taking an enormous burden. Uh, three million uh, Ukrainians uh, have come over, including uh, out-of-country people, to Poland. Uh, they've placed 180,000 people, remarkably, in their school systems already. The, the, population, of Ist uh, the population of Warsaw is up. 17 percent. It's, it's just an enormous undertaking that they're doing, to their credit. Uh, can we do more? Uh, what, what could we do and what's budgeted for helping uh, Poland, uh, helping these countries, helping cities uh, that are taking the bulk of, uh, of, of the people that are coming over, as well as perhaps helping Romania and Moldova, some of those countries as well? Well, I would, I would put Moldova very high up the list. Uh, as Moldova has received the, the highest per capita number of refugees, many have moved on, of course, uh, but for such a small country that's not part of the European Union that doesn't have the same resources injected by that broader super system or supra system, um, it's very, very challenging. Um, for Poland, I met with the mayor of Warsaw, uh, and he, of course, uh, ran through a number of the very significant challenges they are facing. I think 
US, USAID's jurisdiction is more, it's not within the European Union per se. Uh, uh, PRM at the State Department is providing UNHCR and others uh, resources, including there will be additional resources if the second SUP uh, passes the Senate. But for example, one of the things that we can do is work on the Ukrainian side of the border with the education system with which we've had you know, programs over many, many years uh, to ensure that Ukrainian teachers are able to teach those students who happen now to live in third countries uh, because so many of the, including of my own staff, Ukrainian staff who might now be refugees uh, in, in Poland, Romania, or elsewhere, most of their, their, at least my staff, anecdotally, most, if in, in some cases, many and others, depending on the, the community, are still actually doing their Ukrainian classwork online. And so we work with the Ministry of D Digital Transformation, we work with the Ministry of Education to be able to ensure that Ukrainian teachers are getting paid uh, inside Ukraine or getting paid for, by the government of Ukraine, perhaps through some of the direct budget support. The gentleman's time has providing. expired. I, um, I have to. Uh, so we can keep that education uh, afloat. Thank you very much. I now uh, recognize Representative Darrell Iss of California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Chairman, I'm going to ask your indulgence for a very short line of questioning for the ambassador uh, on a previous subject. Ambassador, over here. Yes, no, no. Uh, is it fair to say, from my understanding and your use, that the unmasking that was talked about for quite a while is the result of administrative people using your credentials, your right to unmask, to deliver information that you ask for, and that, per se, there's not a written order that says, please unmask General so-and-so? Is that, is that a correct statement? I am so hesitant to answer this question because uh, it really is not the appropriate forum. But no, I, I just I, yes. But, we, the, but the short answer is yes. Okay, that's all I wanted. Yes. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that we we sort of understand that that term is sort of like you signed something versus your indicia on something. It's not always quite what it seems to be. Correct. Today, uh, going from the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations previously to this job you managed to find the hardest possible alternative to your earlier job at the most important time. So I, I have a couple of questions. We've dealt a lot on, into the wheat situation, and it appears as though you have a great deal on that. The two areas that it appears that you don't have the ability to help surge uh, wheat is the U.S., which is a different cabinet position's job, or independent agency, and uh, one that I wanted to bring up, which is, uh, currently, you are prohibited from operating in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, when it was Rhodesia, was the breadbasket of Africa. If this committee were to relook at, and the administration were to relook at, considering that question, do you see potential for USAID to operate in that country, at least to the benefit of their ability to produce and feed themselves? I, I've been to that country and I've seen the effects of three decades plus of dictatorship. Thank you, Congressman. I have also uh, been to Zimbabwe at a time actually when people were having to carry cash uh, in pillowcases because the inflation was... Yeah, now they use $20 bills, so they've taken care of that okay. problem. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I am, and our agency is driven by the humanitarian imperative, and the needs in Zimbabwe are going to be acute. Um, I, I, I would actually want to look into what those restrictions currently are uh, because, again, in terms of our funding to World Food Program and others, uh, certainly UN agencies are already operating in Zimbabwe, so what you're, you're saying okay. is surprising me a little bit, but uh, well, the, maybe we the need resp to meet respond for, respond for the record. I mean, Please. if you were operating in, in that country, your ability to help people begin farming effectively would be very different than the aid that is currently in Zimbabwe. Uh, I want to switch to a country that, uh, when you when you first came into office, uh, was not on your list, and that's Lebanon. Uh, in this short period of time of, of the last two years, it's gone from being a country that had a huge problem, a far greater percentage of its population were refugees than any other country on earth. Far more uh, refugees are there today than are in Poland, or almost as many as are in Poland, except as a percentage, it's 50% of the population. What's happened differently is that 
the value of their currency and their economy is diminished by 95 percent. So for an agency that normally takes months or years to target a country, how are you reacting to a country that overnight went from middle income uh, to near the bottom? Thank you. Well, let me just say that, um, you know, of course, Lebanon just, just had its elections. And, and congratulations for throwing Hezbollah out in an election. I, I thought you might appreciate the results. Um, but, I, but I think I mentioned that because the paralysis of governing institutions cannot be really separated from the economic uh, downturn turn and spiral uh, that the people of Lebanon have had to endure. I think, you know, largely what we have done is worked, as USA does, you know, trying to provide technical assistance and technical advice as to how to shore up different aspects of the economy. Right now, though, with 81 percent of Lebanon's uh, wheat coming from Ukraine, we are focused on humanitarian assistance. Right, uh, and no storage capability. And, and no storage capability because of the explosion and, 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 so, and so forth. So I think that this supplemental, I don't, I don't have the country breakdown for you yet, uh, but again, with new resources, $4.3 billion coming online for humanitarian assistance, that's a part of the equation, but it's stopgap. It doesn't get at the underlying causes of this unraveling of quality of life and standard of living for the people of Lebanon. And so I think when we look at our food security, which is a separate allocation in the supplemental, uh, thinking through are there things that we can do in the agricultural sector with the new government when it comes in uh, that hopefully will be more dedicated to, to making hard choices in the economic reform area. You know, it's, it's those structural changes that are, that are really needed to stop the free fall. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I want to I thank you for this hearing specifically and for bringing us the kind of a witness that we desperately need on a, a regular basis. And uh, I, again, I thanks for your indulgence on that first question. I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize Representative Ted Deutsch of Florida, who is the chair of the subcommittee of the Middle East, North Africa, and Global Counterterrorism for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Meeks. I join uh, Mr. Issa in uh, praising you and our witness today. Um, so glad to have this opportunity, uh, Administrator. Um, Following years of hard work, uh, Nita Lowy, the Nita Lowy Middle East Partnership for Peace Act was finally enacted into law in December of 2020. As authorized, MEPA directs $50 million for each of the five fiscal years following enactment. And as you well know, the fiscal year 2023 budget request urges Congress to maintain $50 million under the Economic Support Fund, which is consistent with previous years authorization. Uh, over the last year, Department of State, uh, USAID, and, and DFC have been hard at work implementing both the People to People uh, Partnership for Peace Fund and the Joint Investment for Peace Initiative, which resulted in the first three MEPA awards being announced in the past two months. They'll support Palestinian and Israeli private sector initiatives to build partnerships to increase economic growth and to lay the foundation for peace through People to People programs. Uh, our support for grassroots programs, as well as building a viable Palestinian economy, remain fundamentally central to the goal of preserving the possibility of a negotiated settlement leading to sustainable two-state solution. And uh, former Chairwoman Nita Lowy uh, said, uh, and I, for whom the act was named, uh, and I quote, I firmly believe these programs are important to build the foundation for such a peace to take root and endure. Uh, it has been really exciting to watch this become a reality, and uh, we're all excited to see where it goes. And as you approach the halfway point uh, in the first year of MEPA implementation, can you give us an update uh, on the process for awarding grants under the People to People Partnership for Peace Fund that USAID oversees, and when we might see additional grants awarded? Uh, thank you so much, Congressman, and, and thanks for pushing us uh, throughout the, the uh, teething phase, I guess you'd call it, uh, of MEPA. Uh, I think I had to appear here last year and uh, answer as to why we hadn't, uh, um, you know, been able to kind of compress the, 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 the process. Uh, there, you know, there were some startup investments that had, to been that had to be made, not least having the chairman and ranking member of this committee nominate their board members. So we do have a fully constituted board uh, we do have uh, George Salem, who was named as the chair of the board. We've had our first board meeting uh, in April. It's great to see Nita Lowy uh, back in action uh, in, that, in that fashion. 
And uh, as you mentioned, uh, we have three organizations that have received a grant so far. Um, you know, it is uh, $50 million a year, or you know, each year for five years. We have two solicitations. I think this gets to the heart of your question. Um, one on peace building and one on building economic bridges that are out. I, I think the more that you know, we can talk about this being up and running. I think it, you know, there's a lot of uh, attention to it when the legislation passed. Um, I'm not sure, again, yet how, how broadly understood it is. I think our deputy administrator, Isabel Coleman, traveled to the region in part for this reason, to be traveling into the Palestinian territories, talking to Israeli officials, the Kogan and others about you know, how do we really maximize the pool of community members on both sides uh, uh, of the line that, that uh, would wish to be a part of this? So on the solicitation timing, I don't, I don't have that specific in my, in my head, but, but again, I, I would expect in the coming months to have more announcements to Great, make. great, thank you. And can I just ask, obviously MEPA is overseen by Megan Doherty, Deputy Assistant Administrator, um, quite, um, quite ably, but it requires an interagency approach, and I, I wonder if you could speak to how MEPA is working to ensure that these grants are driving broader um, administration policy in this space. Well, as you know, Congressman, USAID is part of, in, in every respect, but certainly on anything to do with Middle East policy, we are part of the interagency process. So the NSC-led process brings to the table everything from the intelligence community, the Department of Commerce, USTR, uh, DFC, of course, the State Department, uh, Treasury, and others. Uh, so I think as part of that process, we are uh, able, uh, working with our colleagues, to to you know have a ever refreshed sense of what our what our objectives are. There is lead time again between a solicitation and then the the the, uh, the rollout or the 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 granting of an award to a particular organization, but. But I think the, there's been extensive communication, again, through the regular interagency policy committee process. Uh, thanks, Mr. Uh, thank you, Administrator. Mr. Chairman, I, I wonder if there, there might be an opportunity in the reporting uh, from our committee about today's hearing to, uh, to post a link to that solicitation so that uh, everyone is okay. well aware of the opportunities available under the, uh, this. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has now expired. I now recognize Representative Ann Wagner of Missouri, who's the vice ranking member of the full committee for five minutes. I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for organizing this hearing, and I thank Administrator Power for her time and uh, service. Administrator Power, Power um, since you last appeared before this committee in July of 2021, the world has become a significantly more dangerous, unstable, and unpredictable place. The Taliban's tragic and appalling surge back to power uh, thanks to the administration's botched withdrawal from Afghanistan, plunged innocent Afghans into dire humanitarian circumstances. Uh, Putin's brutal invasion has forced millions more, more than a quarter of Ukraine's total population, to flee their homes and seek the assistance of neighboring countries. U.S. development and humanitarian activities abroad recognize the inherent worth of all people and leverage the boundless human capacity for generosity, cooperation, and ingenuity to overcome the global challenges. I have said this before, but I think it is particularly true today as the U.S. and our allies unite to protect and serve the vulnerable, the oppressed, and the persecuted. Our values make us the partner of choice for countries seeking self-sufficiency, security, and the ability to determine their own futures. And as we work to consider the aggressive imperialist agendas of China, Russia, and other dictatorial states, strong and confident American leadership is more important, ma'am, than ever. Administrator Powell, I co-chair the Congressional Caucus on the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN. ASEAN countries are deeply worried about China's clear intent to dominate the region and are urgently calling for increased U.S. engagement, especially in the infrastructure sector. Can you 
tell me how USAID is supporting infrastructure development in Southeast Asia and what sorts of project USAID plans to prioritize. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Um, first, let me say uh, that I agree with everything you've said about the importance of U.S. leadership at this moment. Um, second, I had the privilege of attending the ASEAN summit uh, last week, um, chaired by President Biden. I was in a session chaired by Vice President Harris. The entire interagency turned out in force to engage with the heads of state who had traveled uh, here for a very unusual gathering that I think will be the first of, of many. And your question really was the question, at least in the, in the uh, session I was in, that we were delving into, particularly as it relates to transitioning uh, to renewable energy. Um, uh, the uh, Development Finance Corporation, of course, has a big role uh, to play there, as many countries are very eager uh, to meet their uh, newly ambitious um, uh, emissions targets to bring down emissions quickly. Uh, to draw on solar, hydro. There's so many opportunities in the Mekong and beyond uh, to draw on hydropower. Uh, USAID's work uh, is concentrated there, and you'll see in the 23 funding request, uh, a request for additional resources, uh, in, particularly, again, in the energy and, and climate domains, but also helping countries that have withstood the COVID pandemic, where we have provided um, uh, hundreds of millions uh, or tens of millions of vaccines, um, really helping that region uh, cross the 70% threshold uh, that WHO recommended on COVID uh, vaccination uh, more quickly than, than many other regions in Ad the world. Administrator, yes. Administrator, if I could, and, and I, I hate to interrupt, but I've got just a short period of time left. I want to get one more question in. Um, how does USAID programming in Southeast Asia and in the Indo-Pacific region as a whole help our partners resist China's coercive economic and diplomatic and financial policies. Does USAID have a roadmap to help countries that are highly dependent on China reduce their vulnerability to China's malign influence operations? Well, first, let me again embrace uh, the, the, the premise, I think, where you started and where you're now finishing, which is that is what either openly or privately so many of these countries are, are really, really eager to do. They are eager to be in a position to secure resources that don't entail uh, decades of debt mortgaging uh, uh, the futures of their young people in order to uh, have to carry that debt into the future. They're eager for environmental impact statements so that infrastructure projects uh, don't harm the environment, but in fact are rooted in withstanding uh, climate events, let's say, but also uh, uh, built in such a fashion that actually hastens that transition, uh, again, to clean energy. So um, I think everything from the Countering uh, Chinese Influence Fund, which you all have generously uh, supported, mm -hmm. to the investments we make in an open and s secure uh, internet in the digital sphere, uh, to these kinds of investments that, again, don't come with the transaction um, or with the, the strings attached uh, that uh, PRC investments come with. I think the, these are the domains in which USAID and our, our partners across the U.S. government have been. Yeah. The talk. gentleman's My, time you, has thank expired. You. I have expired, so I, so I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize Representative Jerry Connolly of Virginia, who is the president of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much for having us hearing today. Um, welcome. Administrator Paris, it's so great to have you here, and I just want to thank you for your leadership. Uh, uh, I've been involved uh, with AID uh, going back to the late 1970s, uh, and I think uh, you stand out uh, in putting an imprint on aid that um, I think puts us in a really positive direction, so thank you for your leadership. Um, let me ask about the Global Health Security Act you and I worked on, and the chairman co-sponsored. It passed out of this committee multiple times. It passed on the floor of the House multiple times. We got it into the National Defense Authorization Act as a provision of that draft bill. We negotiated with the Senate, and of course, at the last minute, whimsically and arbitrarily, one member of the Senate just decided he didn't want to do it and an important piece of legislation and an important, more importantly, piece of public policy died. 
And so now we have to do it all over again. Could you just comment on why you got involved in that effort and why you thought, not the bill as such, but the need to have a global health security policy and to restore a coordinator position either at NSC or at the White House was so important and, the, and, and what role AID might have played in that and hopefully will in the future. Um, thank you so much for championing this and thanks to the chairman as well. Um, you know, I, I, I do think it is uh, extremely important that we see uh, reflected in our budget and in our institutions, um, in our governing institutions, the priority that we must place on this key component of our national security. Um, you know, I think that our 23 budget request reflects the budgetary piece of that. Um, that's something I'll have to take up with the, uh, the appropriators and, and, and appeal to them to make investments not only in the vaccines of today or the therapeutics and tests of today, but in uh, the ability to strengthen uh, countries' um, health inf infrastructure to, in everything from surveillance to labs to the training of health workers, where President Biden just issued a new health worker um, a training initiative that I think is so important. Uh, but, but we have to look ahead. We can't uh, keep having to reinvent the wheel every time there is a new uh, global health emergency of this of this magnitude, and you know, I lived some of the investments that were made since 2014, uh, after the Ebola crisis, uh, such as the creation of the African CDC, uh, certainly uh, changes at USA that put us in a in a position to be uh, much quicker uh, uh, on the draw uh, this time around with, when when COVID struck. But you know, when you think about the loss of life in this country. Uh, by virtue of a pandemic reaching our shores, and, and when you think about the number of families whose lives have been, you know, permanently uh, deprived of people, we just, the human stakes are so high of preventing anything like this from happening again. And again, that's resources, but it's also just ensuring that every agency in the U.S. government is singing from the same hymn book and making the kinds of investment, whether Treasury through the World Bank, or the intelligence community, you know, in terms of what it is collecting on in the global health space, or what we do in terms of program, all of that being brought to bear together in the way that your bill uh, would have done, I think just, just so important for the future. I think it's important to note too that Mr. Shabbat and I introduced that bill on a bipartisan basis uh, several years before COVID-19 struck. So it wasn't in response to COVID-19, it was actually in response to the Ebola Ebola crisis, where we were caught flat-footed globally, uh, and WHO did not have its finest moment, and lots of quick work had to be done by AID and others to compensate for the uh, tears in the fabric, shall we say, in terms of the immediate health response. Uh, at some point, uh, Administrator Power, I'd love to sit down and talk to you about uh, upgrading the underlying legislation that authorizes AID, uh, which uh, we haven't passed an aid authorization bill since 1986, uh, and we haven't really updated the underlying authorization act since the early 60s. Uh, lots has happened in between, and we might want to think about uh, trying to streamline the objectives and goals and purposes, which number over 250 now in the existing law. Um, in any event, I'd welcome that opportunity, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my time is up, and I thank you so much for this opportunity. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman's time has expired. I now uh, acknowledge Representative Brian Mast of Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ma'am, for attending today. Uh, just go from a quote off your website to begin with to set the stage for my question. USAID improves the lives of the Palestinian people, and this is an important word, too, to set conditions for a viable two-state solution. Uh, how does improving the lives of Palestinians work to set conditions? How does us paying to improve their lives work to set conditions? Well, I think that um, part of the logic, for example, of uh, the Middle East uh, Partnership Act that was passed uh, by this body and and by the Senate and that we've now begun to implement is that as you create economic development in the Palestinian territories, but particularly 
when you can create, you know, kind of cross-line trade, uh, cross-line partnerships um, in water, sanitation, those kinds of connections, those human connections, uh, give rise to more trust, create a different kind of climate than that which exists right now. Are they ready today for, to be a second state? Pardon me? Are they ready today to be a second state? Well, as you know, uh, there, there is no assistance provided um, by USA to the Palestinian Authority uh, under law, and I think the the are they ready to be a second state? I think you're that setting conditions for the last 20 years. Are they ready to be a second state after billions of dollars? Well, I don't think. In fact, I mean, given that all assistance was cut off, in fact, uh, to to the territories, I don't think it's accurate to characterize the last 20 years in that in that fashion. Are they ready today to be a second state? I think that there is no negotiation right now underway that is even, uh, you know, in in uh, engaging on that question, bringing the parties together to, to ascertain, uh, you know, even what is requirement. I think there's an awful lot uh, of corruption uh, that needs to be addressed uh, within the Palestinian Authority. If there's Again, no negotiation to do this, then that begs the question of why support a uh, $185 billion million dollar request for West Bank and Gaza. Well, I think but to, but to, to, to go reasons. to the question, yeah. are they ready today to be a second state, in your opinion? Again, there's no process underway that is about to, to culminate in, in Palestinian statehood, but I think our- But you're working to set the conditions. To, Have you met the conditions? Are they ready? I, I don't think the website said that we had I, set the I just the read conditions. it to you. No, no. I, I to think improve the say, lives of Palestinian right, I don't people think it, it, to I don't think set it was, conditions. It, right, which is not saying that we had, or, or anybody had set conditions, it's saying working to uh, actually improve the economic uh, welfare of people living in often very difficult circumstances. To set especially. conditions, there's no comma or period, no, to no, set right. conditions but for a two-state solution. That's what the website says. Right, the very done thing for that the last you're So just, is, uh, again, it, it, are they ready today to be a second state? You're our working job, to set the conditions, are they ready? Our job as USAID is to invest in programs that are gonna improve conditions on the ground which will benefit not only the Palestinian people, but, but the broader uh, the broader region. So and set conditions we'll for a two-state solution, period. That's the website's statement. So are they ready today to be a second state? I'm going off your website. But the website doesn't say that which you are using as the predicate for your question. So I'm reading I'm gonna, it right from your website. No, 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 no. I understand what you're reading from the website is on the website, but then your question is saying something entirely. The are they ready say, today to be a second The website state. doesn't say they're ready or not ready. The no, I'm asking is, you. I'm asking you to say, are they ready or not? <laughs> we could keep going back and forth uh, Clearly we like can. this. We've done but, it for four but, minutes. Um, but uh, what I will say, again, is that the Palestinian Authority still practices, for example, the pay to slay. Uh, program, which is uh, outrageous, and that would lead me to say they're not ready. As one example, uh, it is something absolutely uh, that is uh, that that no sovereign member state should 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 uh, of the United Nations should embrace. Uh, our emphasis as USA, we are not involved in negotiations around a two. So are they not ready? Are they not ready? We are not involved in negotiations around a two state solution. We, we are involved, involved if we're we spending $185 million a year of our taxpayer money. In we are involved. Every taxpayer, ma'am, every taxpayer would agree. We're directly involved if we're spending $185 million. We're involved in the region. So are they ready or not ready? We're involved in the welfare of the Palestinian people uh, through education, through sanitation so, programs, not through, ready yet. through food security programs. Again, I'm going to leave it ready. to Thank people who are involved in the negotiations to discuss. Ready. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Dean Phillips of Minnesota for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, greetings to you, Madam Ambassador. Um, I just read moments ago that a GOP gubernatorial candidate in Pennsylvania uh, said that she would not support the eventual nominee today if it is not her because, and I quote, I have no intention of supporting globalists, uh, a, a concept shared by, in my estimation, too many in our country right now. So perhaps if you would just take a moment uh, and express to the American people uh, why foreign assistance, why international development is in our country's best interest and in democracy's best interest uh, and in our national security best interest. Uh, thank you. I mean, 
for starters, every American has an interest in seeing, um, for example, uh, health systems around the world be capable of picking up um, viruses before they turn into epidemics and pandemics. USAID and other foreign assistance uh, is invested in strengthening those health systems, in building labs, in shortening turnaround times so that that detection can occur. Second, we have an interest in uh, curbing radicalization, uh, for example, of young people. When USAID supports humanitarian assistance or schools for displaced persons, uh, we give people or support uh, their ability to have economic opportunities that they might not otherwise have so that when a gang comes calling or uh, a radical group or terrorist group comes calling, uh, young people might have uh, another path that they would be inclined to, to pursue. Uh, when countries emit too much carbon and the planet continues to warm, uh, even as we begin uh, to make transitions here, uh, we will feel the climate effects of uh, other countries' uh, growing emissions in some cases. And so it is in our interest to engage, for example, those countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that uh, are not, or those parts of the countries that are not electrified, to ensure that they go immediately uh, to renewables, to hydro, to solar, uh, to others, uh, as their populations grow and as young people come online. So those are just a few examples of the ways we use humanitarian assistance, foreign assistance, in a manner that advances the interests of the American people. And as you pursue that mission uh, and consider the challenges, are they more relative to financial resources or human resources? Could you, could you yeah, ask? As you pursue your mission, yes. uh, are, are your challenges, as you see them, more predicated on a lack of financial resources or human resources or both? Um, well, I think, as I, I said in my, my opening statement, I think USAID's workforce uh, has been depleted over the years. Uh, there was a lot of uh, staff turnover. There's a need to build a, uh, a younger, more diverse and inclusive workforce. So, so we have come to you with requests in, in that domain. But it goes without saying as well that the global needs are spiraling as we have more displaced people than at any point since Hitler, more conflict than at any point since the end of the Cold War and an intensification of humanitarian emergencies brought about by climate change, a uh, pandemic, and now Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So there are a lot of needs to go around. And um, you know, I, I, one of the things that's exciting that USAID does globally is invest in other countries' human resources with the idea of over time working ourselves out of jobs mm -hmm. because uh, no country actually really wants to be uh, you know, in any way dependent on USAID's assistance They'd like to be in a position to be talking to USTR and, sure. and the Department of Commerce and others uh, rather than me most of the time. Sure, I hear you. Uh, I, I had the pre pleasure recently of being on a call when you introduced the youth policy initiatives uh, at USAID um, as a co-leader with Reps Meng Curtis and Fitzpatrick of the Youth Peace and Security Act. I, I celebrate that. Uh, maybe just take the last minute of, of my time on how your fiscal year 23 budget uh, appropriately resources some of these youth, and youth initiatives that uh, you've introduced. Well, it does so in two ways. I mean, first, uh, increasing a plus up in our uh, funding for youth programming. But if that were the, if you see the numbers there, uh, you know, I, I think it's a little above single digits yeah. uh, in terms of youth programming, maybe even a little below. Um, that's not where the action is. The action is in actually integrating. I mean, that's not merely the, there is some action there, but but it's about integrating young people across the board. Uh, in everything we do. And so as we move to co-design more of our programming in agriculture or on clean energy or in the digital space especially uh, with uh, local organizations, local partners, to make sure that that's not just the same old uh, you know, set of uh, individuals or organizations that we've always worked with, that we're really going out of our way to take account of the fact that 60% uh, of the population in, in many, if not most, of the countries we work, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, are under 30. Most importantly, thank you. Heartfelt gratitude to you and everyone at USAID for building the American brand that I know members on both sides of the aisle. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thanks. Thank you. I now recognize Representative Tim Burchett for the great state of Tennessee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that plug for my great state. It is. I concur with you on that issue. Um, Ma'am, thank you for being here and the, all the usual flowery things we say, and then we go for the juggler, but I'm not going to do that. Um, 
What steps has the administration taken to press the Palestinian Authority to improve its educational materials? And specifically, I'm talking about the, you've seen the, the videos and all the hatred that seems to be pushed out. And I'm wondering how you're ensuring that USAID partners uh, do not promote this incitement with our hard-earned tax dollars. Thank you. Um, well, one of the domains where this has arisen, and I know there's been congressional concern over the years, is UNRWA uh, and questions about textbooks. And I know that's something that doesn't, isn't something USAID funds specifically, but from my last job in the executive branch, you know, I know USUN Ambassador Thomas Greenfield and Secretary Blinken uh, are, you know, always engaging with UNRWA uh, and uh, UNRWA UN leadership is reviewing textbooks and the like to try to make sure uh, that uh, coursework doesn't uh, cross the kinds of lines that, that, that you're describing. Um, you know, USAID in, in the, in, until, until about a year ago uh, wasn't funding work uh, in, in uh, the Palestinian territories, uh, that funding had been cut off. So some of the investments that we had made, uh, for example, in independent media or in civil society organizations that themselves um, uh, you know, are fact-based uh, and, and not inclined to that way, particularly the investments in local education systems, um, you know, those investments have, had, had, uh, had been suspended, you might say, or picked up by other donors. Right. Uh, I think now our programming is, is largely in the kind of wash and sanitation area. We're looking for, for projects um, that uh, we can work on also collaboratively with the government of Israel through the MEPA, MEPA program. Uh, but I think the main answer to your question is that certainly any time I or my deputy I mentioned in a previous exchange was just uh, in the region, uh, just where it is at the top of the list of issues to, to raise with any Palestinian officials that, that we uh, encounter. And I know this is, again, something that Secretary All right. can let, let me get on some more questions, ma'am. I appreciate your talkability here, but um, how are you? <laughs> it's a strong suit, talkability. Yes, ma'am. Irish, yeah. Yeah, thing. A, yeah. Afraid lawyers, they get paid by the word, and I'm not a big fan of them either. I'm not, not that I'm necessarily a big fan of yours yet, unless you answer these questions well, and then I'll be a fan. How are you ensuring adherence to the Taylor Force Act? I'm sure you're familiar with that. It's the thing where they pay the family members uh, if somebody's caught in a terrorist act or they die, and they pay them kind of a pension thing on that. To me, it's sort of a bounty type situation. Um, how are you? ensuring that adherence to the Taylor Force Act and other restrictions of our assistance to the Palestinians. I'm wondering what safeguards do we ensure that no assistance is going to those association, showed, uh, associated with or supporting terrorism? And, you know, I, I guess it's kind of hard to get inside their books, you know, is what I'm saying. It, it, we're always up here and say, oh, no, that pays for this, not that, but we send them a blank check, and sure as the world, they run out over here, they're going to, bring it in over there, and it's a, it's a very fluid amount, I would assume, their bank account. So I'm kind of wondering, how do we ensure that? Well, the law is uh, fairly black letter in the sense that it is uh, the assistance uh, will not directly benefit the Palestinian Authority, and, and we take the law incredibly seriously. We have vetting requirements for all of our partners, again, bearing in mind the, our partners by definition, would be non-governmental, so not uh, the Palestinian Authority, uh, and this in involves, uh, you know, everything from, uh, you know, running the names of organizations and individuals associated with organizations through uh, all the databases that the national security agencies uh, that are part of the U.S. government uh, have. Uh, we have strengthened, this is before my time, strengthened oversight of the prime awardees. There's post-award compliance reviews uh, where you go back over, and that's within 18 months of implementation. Uh, we have a team on the ground, as you know, our USAID mission. Um, okay, ma'am, I'm going to run out, but let me ask you, have y'all ever stopped any, any funding because of that? Yes, simple yes or no. It'll be fine. I'm not trying to be a jerk, but I'm out yeah, of time. No, 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 I don't. Um, in my time, because I, I, I only... I would have to get back to you on the lifetime of USAID assistance in the region, but if I may just 
In my time, we are just getting our assistance. A simple yes or no, so, ma'am. I appreciate no, I, it. I don't have the ability to answer what's happened over the 61-year life of USAID, but I'll get Gentleman's time has expired. Right. I now recognize Representative Joaquin Castro of Texas, who is the chair of the Subcommittee on International Development, International Organizations, and Global Corporate Social Impact for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, this budget reflects important priorities, including resources for climate, women and girls, and food security. Uh, but beyond funding, making serious progress on any of these issues is going to take far more innovation, new partners, and new ways of solving problems. Uh, during the budget hearing last year, I asked you about the issue of innovation and asked you to prioritize it during your tenure, which you said that you would. And USAID's Development and Innovation Ventures Office has one of the highest returns on investment in all of USAID and the entire federal government, a $17 social return for every $1 invested. But it receives about just 0.1% of USAID's budget each year. So its potential for impact is therefore limited. In addition to increasing resources for this office, the DIV, can you talk about how USAID can better integrate this highly effective innovative unit into the rest of the agency and ensure that its efforts are not limited to just one part of the agency. Thank you. Um, this is something that we are looking at, Congressman, and, and of course welcome ideas from you and your team um, as we uh, seek to bring on an, a new chief economist. Um, as you know, uh, the economist um, Michael Kramer uh, was very involved uh, in the DIV uh, over, over its life, and including doing some of the studies about the return on investment that you've mentioned. Uh, but I do, I do think this question of how to integrate, particularly at a moment like today where we're facing uh, a, food, a food crisis, a food security crisis of this magnitude, uh, to be able to take small ideas um, be able to move money quickly, nimbly, as uh, the Innovation uh, Ventures uh, effort has done in the past, uh, and then potentially scale them over time, uh, whether through Feed the Future or through, uh, you know, a clean energy program. Uh, so I don't have a, a complete answer for you. Uh, I will say again that we're very earmarked at USAID um, more than uh, I had imagined and more than was true at the tail end of the Obama administration. So that does limit our ability uh, to, to move money around, including uh, to, to, to uh, beef up that, that percentage that you referenced, which is a very, very small percentage of the overall budget, especially given the good that, um, that it has done in the past. Well, thank you. And I want to ask you, with regard to the, the chief economist, where are you in the hiring and selection of that person? Um, it, I, I would expect I, I, I shouldn't get ahead of the process, but uh, I would expect uh, certainly us to have a chief economist in place uh, over the summer at some point, hopefully in the early part of the summer. But but um, uh, anyway, yes, I think I think that's probably the best timeline I can offer. Well, thank you. Uh, and on a separate subject, under your leadership, you've talked about initiating and quote anti sludge effort to eliminate a lot of the unnecessary red tape to make it easier for new organizations to work with USAID and for USAID to be able to move more quickly. Uh, this is particularly important for the success of your efforts on localization, and I believe these efforts are important to make USAID an effective organization. Uh, you speak to the status of these anti-sludge efforts. How pervasive are unnecessary requirements in grants or procurement, and what are you doing to remove that red tape? Well. First, Congressman, I would also I would attach this both to the localization initiative that you've championed for a long time, and also to President Biden's broader initiative, which uh, is captured in an executive order on what he calls uh, customer service, which is an interesting way I think to think about desludging or about reducing administrative and and, and reporting requirements. So whether that's um, you know working in our case with governments overseas to make it easier for small businesses to start up by uh, reducing paperwork burdens, whether that is, as you noted, in our contracting process to shorten uh, the length of contracts, which can sometimes run uh, 150 pages, uh, I gather, um, to 
you know, everything from onboarding of officials here as we try to, to staff up at USAID to meet these uh, really difficult threats of the moment. So we have uh, in the front office, our deputy, our deputy administrator uh, uh, is uh, the lead on this, working across bureaus. Uh, bureaus are needing to come forward uh, with ideas for how they can cut sludge in the here and now, and then some of these longer term reforms around procurement, uh, around paperwork requirements on missions that keep them away from the field. They're in the field in the sense that they're in other countries, but they're away from the actual projects and, and beneficiaries because they're so busy filling out forms. Um, that's gonna be a longer term process. Thank you for asking. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Mark Green, again of the great state of Tennessee, uh, ranking member of the West Subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere, Civilian Security, Migration, and International Economic Policy. I know it's a mouthful, Mr. Chairman, but I think you came up with the title of that uh, committee. I did. So it's all. <laughs> um, thank you for holding the com committee hearing, and of course, ranking member for your your leadership and uh, administ administrator power. Thanks for being here. Um, soft power is a crucial component to uh, not only the projection of America's strength, but also the protection of our our strength. And as a complement to hard power, soft power helps strengthen our partnerships and. Uh, grow those alliances stronger, and I think that's uh, a big part of where USAID comes in. Uh, your budget, as I recall, was, I think, for fine, for assistance last year, $30, $31.7 billion, so that's a big commitment. Um, but with inflation raging, you know, at 40-year highs, we got to take a hard look at all the line items in a budget and make sure that those taxpayer dollars are wisely spent. Um, and, and from my standpoint, the folks in my district, uh, the 700 and 60,000 people that I represent, they want to see that money directed toward national security objectives, uh, countering the Chinese Communist Party, um, particularly the Belt and Road Initiative, how we use our assistance to uh, checkmate what China is doing, uh, and for reducing the push factors that lead to Ill illegal immigration, uh, economic opportunities. And one of the ways that we can strengthen particularly that uh, is uh, this bill that we just recently dropped, myself and Chairman uh, Sirez, a bipartisan bill. It's uh, H.R. 7579, the Western Hemisphere Nearshoring Act, and it will reduce our supply chain's dependence on Chinese manufacturing while fostering economic prosperity among our southern neighbors. Uh, and since it leverages private sector dollars and China tariff money, it costs the taxpayers nothing. And I urge the administration to take a look at that and, uh, of course, to spend our foreign aid and assistance um, with care and avoiding, the, you know, sort of divisive cultural issues, uh, prioritizing on national security objectives. My first question is, uh, you know, the Chinese Communist Party has vastly expanded in Latin America. Um, Nineteen regional countries are a part of the Belt and Road Initiative. How is USAID working to counter the CCP's sort of debt trap diplomacy uh, and promote uh, sort of our developmental side and, and pulling those folks sort of back into our um, strong alliances? Um, well, le let me try to be brief since I was accused of talkability uh, <laughs> a, a minute ago by your colleague. Um, but uh, first let me say that I think there's much more emphasis being placed on the Caribbean countries, uh, where, for example, USAID has a much smaller presence, but where you've seen the PRC um, really make, make inroads, including I met recently with both the Prime Minister of Jamaica and that of Barbados, and Barbados is a Belt and Road country, right there. Um, and so we are looking uh, at, uh, and I think you'll see this reflected, I hope, at the Summit of the Americas, uh, but whether some of the financing arrangements uh, that currently exist that make it hard to do substantial investments, you know this better than I do, uh, in our hemisphere, because a lot of the countries are technically middle-income countries, uh, you know, how those arrangements can either be altered or supplemented uh, in a manner that would allow uh, more of the investment along the, kinds, uh, along the lines of what you're describing. I think the... Oh, sorry. And well, if I could yeah, jump please. in real no, quick. please do. You know, I just had a meeting with the ambassador from Jamaica, and her... And we were talking about my nearshoring bill because in, in it I asked that they uh, open a allow Taiwan to open a business office. And 
she began to describe to me the challenge in competing with the Belt and Road Initiative, which was great conversation. They come in and build hard infrastructure. The local politician can go see that bridge and get reelected. And so this loyalty, to use their word, to China becomes real. How do we, how do we compete with that? Well, first, I, I think there is a fair amount of buyer's remorse, notwithstanding uh, that initial understood. loss. Yep, I so, think that's the so, yeah. But I don't think we can rest on, uh, on that alone. But, but it is noteworthy to see, you know, countries like Zambia, where, you know, the PRC got in with, uh, you know, so so much investment, and now you're seeing again the future of young people in Zambia kind of mortgaged to the yeah. just just the interest on, on the debt that is carried, and and how and and that's, this is where USAID is trying to make additional investments because we have a government that wants to escape that kind of dependence. So I do think our comparative advantage is wanting to work ourselves out of jobs rather than to increase dependence. It's uh, the absence of corruption uh, and indeed uh, pushing a governance and rule of law message, which some governments don't like, which is another source of uh, PRC's appeal is to be, if you're a government and want to stay in, in power for life, you know, the, P the PRC pathway is one that, that asks no questions about that, whereas we are, we are more critical. Um, but if I may, just one example, and I know Mr. Chairman, just, I, I think what, what Vice President Harris has led with the Partnership for Central America uh, which isn't near shoring per se, and that's where the DFC, I think, yep. at, at which USAID supports uh, on the ground can come in. But the Partnership for Central America also shows that with a dedicated effort, we can draw hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars uh, from private sector companies that want to be involved in that broader societal effort and not just governmental effort to offer that alternative. One of, one of the things, and I'll be very brief, I, I, German, if you'll humor me. Um, Mr. Green, you're out of time. Oh, uh, Mr. A minute. Chairman. I have to move. I'm so sorry. Okay. I'll call. I'll call. I now recognize Representative Dina Titus of Nevada for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Administrative Power. You just mentioned corruption. I'd like to ask you about that. Your budget includes a 100% funding increase for anti corruption efforts. Uh, some things that we describe as corruption, other people just think of, oh, that's the price of doing business in some countries. So I wonder if you could explain to us how your anti-corruption initiative is utilizing a top-to-bottom approach to getting at corruption, how you're defining corruption, what you're doing on the ground in countries to try to address the problem. Thank you. Briefly, I would love to, uh, it's such a good question, I would love to encourage, if we could, follow up where we, USAID now for the first time has an anti-corruption coordinator uh, at USAID, Shannon Green, who's part of this interagency uh, task force that President Biden uh, is, who is the first president to declare combating corruption and uh, national security uh, priority, uh, uh, the, the task force that he's assembled. That's one. Two. Uh, maybe just to offer a few examples from, from Ukraine of what we have in mind. Um, we've done everything there from strengthening the National Corruption uh, Commission to strengthening the prosecutor's office uh, to ensure that the people who are involved uh, in prosecution and then the judges in the judiciary uh, separately themselves have been screened and are not corrupt actors, but are there in order to enforce the laws that the RAD has increasingly, has over the years at least been increasingly been uh, putting on the books. But so too are we supporting those outside actors, the civil society groups and the journalists mm -hmm. who uncover the corruption, who expose it. Um, and I think that is sort of the template that we have in places like Northern Central America, where in El Salvador and Guatemala, uh, the Attorney General's office in the case of, of Guatemala and the, in El Salvador, uh, the Supreme Court and other institutions uh, themselves were overtaken by corrupt actors we had to pull the plug uh, on the assistance that we provided and channel it to journalists and to civil society rather than, uh, again, continuing uh, to invest in institutions that were uh, pursuing aims that were antithetical to ours. I will say, Congresswoman, I think corruption is the Achilles heel, not only of the oligarch, which we know, but also of the autocrat. And what we're finding yeah. is that these investments are allowing journalists uh, to tap at that vulnerability uh, that those leaders who are trying to, to roll back uh, uh, accountability, roll back checks and balances, uh, it, 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 it is the one vulnerability they feel to their people. There's no leader 
no matter how little they claim to care about public opinion, that wants to have their uh, financial holdings and their squirreling away of public resources exposed. So with the President's Democracy Summit, you're right, we've asked for an increase in our funding, which was very uh, marginal uh, before we came into office um, relative to, to other investments we've made. And if we are serious about this battle between democracy and authoritarianism and winning that battle, uh, it, funding those actors that are, again, getting at this Achilles heel of those who would backslide is, is a really uh, sound investment. Well, thank you. I serve on the House Democracy Partnership, and in some of our visits with uh, parliamentarians as well as NGOs revealed reveal that uh, working with NDI and some agencies like that, they've actually even been engaged in helping to draft anti-corruption statutes. Usually this effort is taken on by new members, and often those members are women who can kind of make it their charge to go after this corruption. And I, I wonder how you all interact with those kind of groups. Well, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm going to uh, take a bet that the work that you're describing was funded by USAID. <laughs> Uh, because sure, that's a, it is, I'm sure. particularly, in, and so, you know, the National Endowment for Democracy and NDI and IRI are key partners of ours, as is IFAS, which is doing, uh, you know, more again uh, uh, on these, uh, on these key, uh, on these key components of the autocrats playbook. Uh, so I think that the progress that was made in Ukraine prior to the war, which as you'll note from President Putin's speech on the eve of the war, is precisely the anti-corruption progress that he wanted to halt uh, with this invasion. It's progress that, that the Ukrainians were making with an eye to integrating with Europe that was making him crazy. Uh, and and, and, and it, the, the exposure that they were doing in Ukraine also of Russian oligarchs and their assets and their co-option of various politicians uh, was extremely uh, unnerving uh, to him and those around him. And so, the, the, again, the, 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 the ways in which uh, autocrats and authoritarians are vulnerable to these investments and the importance of, uh, on the other side of the investments in the rule of law and finding political will among governmental partners like we, we had among many in Ukraine, uh, but not all, uh, that's going to be key also as we think through the reconstruction, the humanitarian assistance. That anti-corruption prism needs to be in everything we do in Ukraine, not just the post-war period. I appreciate that. And I look forward to working has, with you. Oh, yeah, okay. Time has expired. I now recognize Representative Claudia, Claudia Tinney for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and fellow New Yorkers. From the great state of New York. The great state, the greatest state of New York. Of all time. Of, of all time in <laughs> history. It's much better than Tennessee. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Administrator Power. Really appreciate you being here. And uh, I, I just want a couple quick things. I want to just, first of all, uh, I was happy to support the additional assistance for our military uh, that included aid to Ukraine. And uh, like all Americans and taxpayers, you know, I want to know how that money is going to be monitored and make sure that every dollar is tracked. Obviously, American people are concerned about that to ensure that it goes to the best benefit of the Ukrainian people uh, and that I can report back to my district knowing, seeing these horrific images and making sure that that transparent accountability is going to be something that you're going to be providing on a regular basis so that we can track uh, this new investment that we've put in uh, that was part of our new military supplement. Um, I think the question is, will those? Uh, yeah. How can? Uh, what? How? Are we, what are the metrics you're going to be using, and how can? Where? Where will we see these on an ongoing basis? Will you be coming here? Is it going to be something on a website? Are we going to be reporting that to Congress? We just want to make sure every dollar is really going to the Ukrainian people, and and, and people are concerned about the mismanagement potentially of that, not because of USAID program, but because of what some of the past history we're seeing Absolutely. Here. No, I think it's, uh, well, let me just say that I, I really appreciated that the House supplemental bill wrote in provisions, at least as it related to the direct budget support. Mm -hmm. I believe it's every 90 days, uh, Secretary Blinken and myself, perhaps, uh, other uh, interagency colleagues have to report back as to how uh, that very substantial infusion of assistance would be spent. Direct budget support is not something uh, that USAID generally does. We've just uh, made uh, 
500 billion has already been uh, been obligated and an additional 500 million going because of the Ukrainian government's burn rate. So I think it's it's we're but building I think the, the question is how do we track that? No, no, so, I understand. Right, yeah. I, I, I right. mean we are channeling it through the World Bank that okay. has policies and procedures in place from doing this kind of thing around the world. So that is our uh, partner of choice in this instance. Um, I think then there's a question about the humanitarian assistance, which is, uh, you know, being largely channeled through the large international humanitarian partners that are used to our tracking requirements, where we're constantly, okay. you know, you've seen it operating in other theaters in the world. And then the investments that we are making in Ukraine's own institutions to do that tracking. Um, now, that may sound uh, counterintuitive, but again- Is that a USAID function? Yes, okay. that is, is a huge part of our go governance okay. programming. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. Now, another, I just wanna quickly, since you were just at the ASEAN conference, uh, how, are you, how is USAID navigating the development assistance uh, and the portfolio with, the, with uh, relation to the coup and the junta uh, government in Burma, Myanmar, since this is a huge issue for, for me and with almost 5,000, a little over 5,000 actually, Burmese refugees in my community, we are tracking this and want to be, obviously would like the great outcomes, but is there something that was, I hope it was prime on, this, on the calendar and, and on the, the agenda in uh, the ASEAN conference? Um, well, first to say USAID, of course, provides humanitarian assistance through international and non-governmental partners uh, and, and stays clear uh, of the junta with the coup, we, re and you know this, I think, because we've mm. maybe spoken about this before, but we reprogrammed assistance that we had, where we had been working with various ministries, two civil society actors and others holding those ministries to account. Um, with regard to ASEAN, it's no secret uh, that that is uh, a divided uh, grouping mm -hmm. on the question of how hard to push. Um, you know, I think uh, some countries have gone further than they had in the past. Uh, to stand up to the coup, uh, to criticize the coup, but some, and some, again, similarly want to assert independence from the PRC. Others, and I probably don't have to name them, uh, are in a very, uh, feel themselves in some respects in a dependent relationship to the PRC and are more reluctant uh, to raise their voices in ways that we would like. Thank you, I just have a quick question, I don't have much time. Since you and I, I didn't realize, have this uh, Yugoslavia in common, since I used to live in the former Yugoslavia and work for the former Yugoslav Council, and I know you did some uh, pretty incredible work there during the war. Uh, I'm concerned now about what's happening in the Balkans and the influence, and one of my colleagues had mentioned, you know, the what is USA doing about the People's Republic of China's engagement and what's happening with the Belt and Road Initiative there with that influence is coming into the Balkans in a heavy way. Are we focusing on making sure that aid is getting to uh, that region to ensure that the Chinese and the PRC is not influencing them to make them comfortable as, as uh, my colleague referred to earlier? I think I'm out of time. Thank you, Hayil. The gentlelady's out of time. Thank you. I'll, I'll submit a response. Thank you, I appreciate that. And let me say this uh, to the administrator, because uh, I'm gonna have to leave and Mr. Malinowski's gonna come uh, to uh, chair the remainder of the hearing. Uh, I, some of us uh, and other members of the committee uh, have a meeting with the uh, Prime Minister of Greece, uh, those that are on that committee. So I'm gonna have to leave now and probably will not get back uh, in time before you conclude your testimony, but I just wanted to take this time uh, to again to say thank you uh, for taking your time and answering all of the committee's questions uh, and be willing to stay here. We've had to juggle back and forth. People don't know behind the scenes of what was taking place, but you and your staff made every effort that you could be here, be here in a timely fashion, and stay to answer every member's question. Uh, and I really appreciate that uh, and your effort and your diligence uh, and how you, you know, your values that you, uh, you know, lead the world with from USAID's position, positioning. You are the one, you know, can show who America is. They see America on the ground. Uh, and that's why I'm proud to uh, uh, wear your cap, USAID, from America to the rest of the world. So I want to thank you and thank you for your, your being here and all that you do. I'm so proud when I travel and see the work of USEID around the world. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and you're a great ambassador, but we, we need to update your swag, get you more <laughs> USAID swag, and anybody else on the committee?
right, we will go now to Representative Susan Wilde of Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Administrator Power. Um, Susan Wilde here, I represent one of the largest Ukrainian American communities in the United States. Um, over the course of this devastating invasion, I've been struck by the strength and the resilience of my constituents, even as they face the anguish of knowing that their family members' lives are under threat at every moment, and in many cases, not knowing where they are from time to time. Um, we know that from the UN that more than 6 million Ukrainians have sought refuge in neighboring countries. And an, and an additional more than 8 million Ukrainians have been displaced within Ukraine. And those numbers are, I'm sure, constantly subject to change. And as you know, we've worked very hard with the administration um, and thankfully on a bipartisan basis for the most part to provide historic levels of assistance to the Ukrainian people. Um, in terms of the humanitarian assistance overseen by USAID, what have you found to be the greatest challenge in implementing and delivering the aid? Uh, thank you for your generosity uh, and your leadership on, on behalf of your constituents and, and on behalf of the, all the people of Ukraine. The biggest challenge is Putin using starvation as a weapon of war and denying the ability of wounded civilians, you know, wounded anybody to, to, to get out of besieged areas. And while, you know, humanitarians want nothing more than to be in the most dangerous places and to be accessing the people most in need, when, you know, Russian forces say, no, you can't travel, we won't guarantee your security, uh, you know, it makes it really difficult to overcome that. So I would put that uh, atop the list by far. So the, the failure to ha be able to have and rely upon humanitarian corridors, I assume, the, is what the, would really I would just put it in, it, in its medicine. more active in its more active form, which is just the Russian Federation's denial of food, medicine, and water, and the denial of evacuation to civilians in besieged areas. So, you know, the the Russians have also shown the 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 age of. The Ukrainian doesn't matter when it comes to um, their their viciousness. Have you um, been able to develop any kind of strategy to help ensure that children, in particular, receive continuity of health and education services, including those who have been displaced to neighboring countries? Can you address that at all? The specific needs of children. Well, uh, first, just to offer a, a, a fact that I shared in my opening statement, which is just that. Uh, two-thirds of Ukraine's children have been displaced. Two-thirds, which is obviously a higher displacement rate than of any other grouping, and presumably because, uh, you know, parents looking to move their kids before the conflict comes to them or as the conflict comes to them. So I would say, of course, uh, children are, uh, along with, with the elderly and those with, with medical needs, are atop uh, the list of, of vulnerable groups and groups that are broader humanitarian assistance inside Ukraine and that provided by our partners in neighboring countries uh, target. Then there's the whole set of protection questions around unaccompanied children where there, you know, in some cases you'll have uh, kids, you know, under the age of 15 who are sent across the border to safety, uh, you know, while the parents may have to feel they have to stay behind to take care of aging parents of their own. Um, and so, you know, that programming has been gradually uh, ramped up over time, again, particularly in, in neighboring countries. But there we look to UNICEF as our key implementing partner inside Ukraine, as well as the Ukrainian ministries of health, of social service protection, of so social protection, rather, um, and of education uh, to ensure that continuity of service that you mentioned. Thanks. I want to switch gears um, just in the interest of time. I want to talk about USAID's Global Labor Program, which I think is a, a program that's very much under discussed. Um, and specifically, I wanted to advance an idea that I had posed with Deputy Secretary Wendy Sherman when she recently testified before our committee, asking her to take back to the administration the idea of hosting a global summit supporting the rights and safety of union organizers in the labor movement with representatives from the countries where the labor movement was identified by the ITUC as coming at the most under attack in 2021, which would include Bangladesh, Belarus, Brazil, Colombia, Egypt, Honduras, 
Myanmar, the Philippines, Turkey, and Zimbabwe. And I hope that you will um, take this idea back to the administration. I don't know whether Assistant um, Deputy Secretary Sherman has done so, but I really would urge the administration to consider this proposal and um, the powerful message that hosting this type of event would send. And thank you. With that, unfortunately, my time is up and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, next, I'll call on Representative Dan Muser of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. Nice to see you again. So I'd like to discuss a little bit the, uh, the root causes strategy <clears throat> uh, that we've spoken about once before. Um, but first, just to uh, bring up, outline, uh, summarize the crisis that exists at the southern border. I know it must weigh on you as it weighs on a lot of us. The fact that we, we really have a, uh, uh, quite, a, uh, quite a crisis taking place. I mean, just um, last year alone, 1.66 million uh, um, unlawful crossings. Um, you know, and, and in the previous administration, there was uh, 488,000 average over a, a year. I mean, it's almost four times more uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the first year of, of the Biden administration. You know, sadly, so many of these folks are coming across uh, false pretense, uh, cartels. You know, we all hear the stories. You, ambassadors from Nicaragua and, and uh, elsewhere uh, speak about that they're very unhappy about it, to say the least, having a, a brain drain, lo losing a lot of their young people, the type of deaths, the, uh, uh, the abuses that take place along the trek. Uh, again, the, um, you know, the level of drugs uh, coming, coming, coming into our country. So, so uh, the, the, your whole root cause in, in, in initiative, I think, is, is very important. But um, may, may I just ask you this? Is that something that, and I've asked Secretary Mayorkas this, is this something that is discussed with the president and is weighed in on and, and saying, we, you know, we really need some new plans and new policy here to correct this situation? Well, I, I uh, needless to say, there are a lot of factors that would cause any individual to migrate, but I, I and I know uh, implicit in your question is that you think there is, is one factor bigger than the others, but I would also note uh, that Latin America and the Caribbean have 29% uh, of the, the COVID infections uh, globally. The pandemic has been really, really hard on that part of the world. I'm really struck uh, Congressman, uh, that uh, just uh, my colleague, uh, Marcella Escobari, our assistant administrator, was just at the Darien Gap. And just I wrote down these numbers, 140,000 individuals transited the Darien Gap in 2021, 102,000 in the entire seven year period before. And, and this gets to just the changing complexion of who is coming to the border. So my root cause of strategy is in these three countries where there's also uh, an uptick, I, of course. Again, I think related to some of the very difficult economic circumstances and some of the downturns in, in governance and the rule of law uh, in, in, in a couple of the countries. Um, but, but this is a broader phenomenon. I mean, this is where you are seeing people uh, voting their desperation with their feet. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. Th thank you for your response. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, Representative Green brought up earlier uh, the initiative uh, for f a foreign aid idea to accomplish uh, the, the goals through the um, uh, through a program uh, providing financial support and tax breaks and some other financial subsidies for companies to move from China, for instance, or from Asia to uh, Central America. Are you familiar with that bill, an insourcing bill? He brought up his nearshoring bill, but didn't right, right. get into the details. Okay, uh, I, I would like to send you the details and get you your get your thoughts on it uh, to see if that's something that you would work into uh, your root cause initiative. And as I stated uh, last time that you testified, if there's anything that I could try to help with, uh, trade missions, uh, trips to Central America, uh, working on bills that. The, the administration or you feel are essential from an even from a regulatory standpoint. I, I think that's very, very crucial to have such a plan in place over the long term. So I, I do applaud you for that. Um, 
Let me, uh, I have limited time, but just quickly on China and the Belt and Road. Uh, the Belt and Road, my understanding, issues about $4.8 billion a year uh, for different types of aid and financial investment. U.S. foreign aid is $51 billion a year, so a big difference. Uh, we've been at it longer, and, you know, we're just the U.S., and, you know, they, they aren't. Are we using our funding in a manner that, has, that is reflective or at least competing where the Belt and Road competes? All right. Thanks. Time's expired, so if you could. I yield. Thank you, Chairman. Maybe you respond in, uh, in writing. Um, Chair now recognizes Representative Brad Sherman of California. Thank you. The whole world is transfixed by the humanitarian disaster in Ukraine, but 500,000 people have died in northern Ethiopia. Uh, as you note in your testimony, the majority of those facing famine-like conditions in northern Ethiopia and 90 percent of Tigray's population needs humanitarian assistance. Um, right now, maybe three to five percent of the amount of food that's needed is being allowed in. And this is not because humanitarian organizations don't have the food and the capacity. It's because uh, the Ethiopian government lets only a few percent in and the Eritrean government lets nothing in. Um, the, uh, back in December, the Assistant Secretary for African Affairs, Molly Fee, testified before our committee that the State Department had decided to refrain at the current moment from making a public determination on atrocities, human rights, but most significantly uh, whether this is a genocide or an attempted genocide. Uh, just last month, Secretary Blinken was sitting where you are now, and he testified that a legal determination will, in fact, be made uh, on those issues by the State Department. Um, it may not be your exact portfolio, but there's very few people in America who have uh, your background. Um, in your testimony, you say that addressing these atrocities in Ethiopia is a, uh, a major top priority. Uh, if you have a government, or in this case two governments, deliberately starving hundreds of thousands of civilians to death, does that constitute uh, a genocide or attempted genocide? Um, thank you, Congressman. Um, obviously, my past life, uh, this is a, a question, uh, questions of what constitutes a genocide or how courts have adjudicated that over time is something I've studied a lot. But as you noted, it is not um, something as U.S. aid administrator uh, that I'm involved in uh, in terms of making that determination. And you have raised it with Secretary Blinken. I believe he's given you the assurance that that determination will come. I don't think the question of, uh, you know, again, whether one is using uh, uh, that, uh, whether that legal determination is made is, uh, influencing in any way the U.S. government's uh, posture toward the Ethiopian government. In other words, we are acting in just the same way we would be irrespective of, I, I of what I would point that out that in this, this room, I've suggested ways to pressure the Ethiopian and especially, uh, and particularly the Eritrean government, um, which has, of course, the ports that could be used, um, particularly by interrupting um, sea traffic uh, going, you know, uh, even hundreds of miles away from Eritrea. Um, and uh, so there, I think a determination of genocide would spur our administration to do more than simply send harsh letters to Addis Ababa and Asmara. Uh, you visited the, uh, uh, the refugee camp uh, in Sudan where Tigrayan refugees uh, are also hungry. Um, are we going to increase our aid to those refugees? Um, well, we are as part of the, the broader package of assistance that we hope is going to be voted on by the Senate. We are uh, able now to have additional humanitarian assistance to meet global needs that are profound. And just to come back to where you started, you do have a million people facing famine in Ethiopia by the end of June. I mean, we're 
past mid-May, this is upon us, and that includes 700,000 people in Tigray. So, uh, you know, I think the, the, the pressure uh, by the United States has been a belated but imp an important factor in why the number of trucks that have gotten into Tigray in recent days has increased. We got 320 trucks in this past week. But Congressman, as you know better than anybody, we need 500 trucks a week if we are going to meet those those. And, 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 and I would say that Congress should provide the money, but only the administration can provide the pressure, and only the administration can use the U.S. Navy to put additional pressure on the two countries involved. And without that pressure, uh, you got a certain number of trucks in with um, uh, oral pressure. Uh, uh, we can do more. I yield back. Thank you. Chair will now recognize Representative August Pfluger of Texas. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Administrator, I've got a series of questions, so I'm going to try to get through all of them. I'm going to be focusing on the restoring U.S. climate leadership part of uh, the testimony. Who are we trying to catch on the Climate Leadership Board to restore? Well, what I'm trying to do as USAID Administrator is um, meet the colossal needs, is, is support those on the ground who are meeting the colossal needs caused by increased flooding, drought, humanitarian okay. event, emergency. Who, who's the worst actor on climate issues in the world right now, um, your opinion? Well, if you're talking about the world's largest emitter, that would be the PRC. Okay. Um, so how important is energy to USAID's mission? Food, energy, shelter, how, how important is energy delivery to the areas that need it? Well, energy poverty is something, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, that is setting back yeah. everything from healthcare provision to education. So it's it's a really the estimates, I, and I agree with that. It's the estimates I've seen are that over the past ten years, one billion people have been lifted out of poverty with energy that they previously didn't have. One billion people. So, do you think that renewables will provide baseload? Are capable of providing baseload power generation right now? Well, I think if you look at, at Power Africa and the work that it is doing, uh, it is finding a way uh, to generate uh, the kind of electrification that developing countries are craving. Um, well, what per, do, do you think that renewable power... With a combination uh, of... Is renewable power by itself capable of baseload capacity? You know, I think, I think the... The, the markets are speaking on this. I think the technologies are evolving, you know, uh, where, where things will be in a couple of years uh -huh. or in five years, I don't know. But right now, it's a combination of energy sources that are being deployed. Mr. Kerry sat here and he said no. He does not think baseload power is, or that uh, renewables can provide baseload power. So um, what, what percentage decrease in temperatures do you think will will be generated with your, just worldwide global temperatures will be generated with the USAID's several billion dollars into, I think it's, you know, the, the words I'm looking for here are uh, the climate financing gap and um, mitigation and adaptation. What, what's the temperature decrease that we're going to see? Well, with respect, Congressman, every increment that any one of us can contribute to the broader effort to keep emissions to 1.5 percent or or, or, or 1.5 degrees, or you know any increment as close to that as we can get, uh -huh. even if it's a tiny uh, contribution, is a relevant contribution. Otherwise, okay. we'd have a collective action. Plan. On the flip side of that, what will a kilowatt hour cost when these when these initiatives are input in sub-Saharan Africa? Because you brought that up. Yeah. What, what will the kilowatt hour cost? With you know what, Congressman, I, I feel to some extent that this exchange, you know, I could see maybe five years ago having an exchange of this nature. Uh, but the thing is, the countries in which we work want to make these shifts. This okay. is not our but ideology what, what I'm, what or I'm, our doctrine. No, I, I mean, what I'm saying is what, 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 what makes sense 
is to listen to the communities in which we are working, the partner governments in some cases, or the energy ministers. Sure. They are interested in saving money. To save money over time, they're interested in using solar and wind. They think that is a really sound financial investment. Turns out, the entire private sector is actually voting with its feet in that manner as well. Well, I think that's So we can, that's we can have a debate about, you know, the cost benefit here or there. No, I think no, it's an important there, debate to have, but, but I'm what I'm reclaim, saying is I'm going to reclaim my time, Administrator. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I, I felt like that was slightly condescending on, the, uh, uh, on your part for the exchange that we could have had five years ago. Um, the point is that you, you said something that's very interesting, that the markets are speaking. Um, and, and I think that that's where it should be, that the market should speak. And when we're talking about energy, it's not just the price, it's not just the availability in certain areas like Sub-Saharan Africa or the Indian subcontinent, but it's also the reliability. It's also the, the ability to get it there. Um, and I'm, I'm very concerned about some of the rhetoric here, and I ask you detailed questions because you, there's some big goals in here and I'm just not sure that USAID is the right venue for some of these goals if we're not able to actually deliver affordable and reliable energy. Time's expired. Uh, Chair recognizes Representative Omar of Minnesota for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, Ambassador Powers, if we can just um, if I can just piggyback on uh, some of the exchange that was just taking place, um, I, I do agree with you that this is um, uh, really what many African um, leaders are asking for. Um, Africa has 17 of the 20 most climate vulnerable countries. And in general, most countries lack the infrastructure and resources needed to adapt and adapt to green energy technology and initiatives. Some African governments urge that transitional framework will be required to help capitalize and eventually wind down their reliance on gas and other um, fossil fuels. What exactly is USA doing to help prepare African governments that have identified deficit in infrastructure capital and other resources to make much needed green energy transition and what challenges have you identified and how we in congress can help you overcome that uh thank you so much i think congresswoman your question was focused um as as was the prior exchange um, mainly on mitigation um and i guess what i would say is in that regard a lot of the work that we do uh is not you know, again, grand uh, infrastructure uh, projects per se, but on mitigation, working with countries where their regulatory frameworks are adjusted uh, to uh, reduce emissions, where their own, uh, you know, everything from, um, uh, you know, sort of greenhouse gas uh, rules, their power plant rules, their transportation infrastructure rules, guidelines, design features, where, where the emissions question or their nationally determined contributions is the filter through which they are making judgments about how the, that the regulatory cost benefit analysis is done. So that's a kind of technical role. Then of course, as you know well, in Power Africa, and this allows me to, to respond to the last point that was made by the prior speaker, I mean, often it is, you know, USAID with grant financing that might be uh, you know, at the, at the foundation uh, of, a, of a pyramid, then allowing a private sector actor to come in and feel more comfortable bearing less risk, where USAID bears the first layer of risk. Uh, you asked about the challenge, though, and there I might just pivot, because uh, strangely it hasn't come up that much today, which is adaptation is the challenge. <laughs> you know, ad I mean, climate change is touching every single area of human development on, on planet Earth. Uh, and in countries that are where the poverty rates are high to begin with and people are living on less than $2 a day, you know, that extra week of, of drought or that uh, flooding, you know, that, that, that washes away the gains of this year's harvest, that's an existential set of questions. That, that um, bridge that disappears in, in a hurricane that is the sixth hurricane, you know, over a, a, a two-year period, I mean, 
So uh, again, that's where the, the, the technical advice in part about, again, how to, how to build just as FEMA is doing here uh, with, with building codes and, and, and other features, but how to uh, build in a resilience to the infrastructure that is being built, let's say, with support from the multilateral development banks and others. And I, I, I'm, I'm curious, Ambassador, if I can also just interject and maybe, maybe have you uh, expand on uh, some of that sustainability and adaptation um, that is needed. We know that food insecurity is also a huge threat, and we know that a third of the world's wheat supply used to come from Russia and Ukraine, and the Russian illegal um, invasion of Ukraine has now exasperated an already dire food insecurity um, and food crises that are taking place. So part of the supplemental budget that the House passed um, includes uh, resources in, in helping address the food insecurity. How can that be used to create some infrastructure in countries um, in, in Africa and other parts of the world, like Yemen and others that are experiencing um, uh, food insecurity? Well, first, it's extremely important that the supplemental uh, written by you all here and, and, and pending passage, we hope, uh, in the Senate was written to allow that humanitarian assistance to meet the needs of people in Ukraine who are suffering, but also to meet the needs of people who are suffering from the fallout from the war in Ukraine. And that's, that's really, really important because uh, humanitarian assistance, uh, unfortunately, is going to be a big part of the response that we are going to need to mobilize globally. And why do I say unfortunately? Because that's not the same as development. If you have a dollar, you'd much prefer to be investing that dollar in a manner that was gonna produce a more sustainable gain. And we're looking at how to do humanitarian assistance in a way that, that, that advances that objective. But, you, but additionally, there is the food security resources along with the humanitarian assistance. And I think that's where we wanna look at more strategic uh, policies and programs because this is the first infusion uh, of resources to meet a crisis that predated uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine. Um, and so how to do so in a manner where agriculture ministries and others are uh, making the sort of systemic investments that we need, we need them to make. Thank you. Thank you, I yield back. <laughs> we want to try to get everybody a chance. So um, we'll turn now to Representative Young Kim of California. Thank you, Chairman. And I want to thank you, Administrator Power, uh, for joining us today. Um, we're almost coming to an end of this hearing. But I do want to go back to an issue that uh, you had uh, conversed with uh, Brett Sherman earlier. After more than a year of fighting between the um, Tigray People's Liberation Front and the Ethiopian government, the humanitarian situation in northern Ethiopia remains exceptionally dire, with seven million people still suffering acute food insecurity. Uh, in late March, we saw some hopeful signs when um, the government and the TPLF announced a humanitarian truce to allow aid to flow into those affected regions. Since 2000, uh, July 2021, the UN has said that 100 trucks must enter Tigray per day to meet the humanitarian needs. But I heard you uh, saying that we need about 500 trucks a day. Well, in the month and a half since the Ethiopian government announced a humanitarian truce on March 24, less than 300 total trucks have entered Tigray. That is way below what is needed to meet the humanitarian needs there. So with that backdrop, my question is, how is the administration working with the UN and other international partners to address the humanitarian crisis in Ethiopia and the Tigray region? And what points or pressure uh, or leverage can we use to ensure that international aid is able to reach the vulnerable civilians uh, who need it the most? Thank you, Representative, and I, I think we've had an exchange on this in the past. I really appreciate you staying on top of it because uh, I think there, there was a temptation in, in certain circles to say, oh, humanitarian truce, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe somehow the problem has been addressed. Um, just to be clear, uh, if I might have misspoken earlier, but it is 500 trucks a week, trucks a week. Uh, that are that are needed, not not a day. But okay. we're still your point is still valid, and and the point I made earlier is still valid, which is that we are nowhere near 
those numbers and we have, again, 700,000 people in Tigray facing grave, grave peril. Uh, we did just this past week see 320 trucks go. Uh, that is more than it had gone in the entire prior period since the March 24th truce. So my team on the ground, Congresswoman, is seeing some signs of an opening. And I met with the Minister of Finance, the Ethiopian Minister of Finance, when he was here a, a few weeks ago. I mean, he indicated much more uh, personal engagement. Um, you know, I think, again, there is small signs of a shift, but the easy way to show whether or not you are using food as a weapon of war is to let food in, and not only food, because I think we focus a lot on the trucks. There is a need for cash, for telecommunications equipment, for fuel. Yeah. I mean, Tigray cannot be on Internet, it needs to be on international life support at the moment, given the acute needs, but it cannot be on international life support forever, uh, actually opening up uh, the area so that real life can resume and, and goods can flow and markets can open. That is the only way to deal with the food crisis of this nature. You ask what we can do, mm -hmm. I think more diplomatic pressure, including by, by our, our, our special envoy and by uh, Secretary Blinken and others. I think the, the phone call that President Biden and Prime Minister Abe had, at least it correlates with a period in which more, more progress was made, so, so, so our high-level engagement is clearly important. They're looking at the international financial institutions and looking for relief there in light of the food crisis that Ethiopia as a whole is facing, mm -hmm. and there again to make clear that everybody deserves food. Everybody okay. deserves uh, well, let me, access to seeds. Let me just continue yeah. on that conversation, but let me further ask you about what is the biggest impediments, if any, to scaling up that humanitarian assistance in Tigray? And what role is the government of Ethiopia, the regional authorities, and TPLF playing in response, uh, in response efforts, and similarly blocking access into the region? What are the greatest areas of need on the ground? Uh, you mentioned, you know, when we are talking about bringing some uh, the this uh, humanitarian uh, needs, from December 2021 to late March of this year, there has been zero uh, humanitarian convoys entered into uh, Tigray. So what are the biggest Im impediments? I think the, it has been the, throughout this whole period, the, the government of Ethiopia's um, uh, either obstruction or unwillingness to do the work to ensure that uh, local and regional actors allow those trucks to pass. I think the local and regional actors in Afar and Amhara also have, have of late been uh, difficult to work with. Um, and, you know, there are reports about the TPLF, uh, you know, commandeering some of the supplies that are meant for civilians. So, so every single actor, mm -hmm. uh, you know, must act responsibly and with far more urgency than we have seen on the ground up to this point. Let me ask, uh, put in one more question regarding you. I has it. Okay. Well, I yield back. Thank you, Congressman. Um, all right. Uh, now, Chair recognizes uh, Representative Andy Levin of Michigan for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks so much for being here, Ambassador Power. It's great to see you. Uh, so, under the Biden administration, more than 20,000 people have been removed or deported to Haiti uh, in the last several months. I've called on the administration to halt these flights, as I believe these deportations exacerbate an already dire security situation and places these migrants at severe risk. Now, those deportations are not your <laughs> policy matter, but my question to you is whether USAID has developed any procedures for tracking or supporting those removed to Haiti and is the agency providing assistance and support to ensure their well-being? Uh, thank you. Um, I will have to get back to you on the, the specifics uh, of, and, and the latest on the, the numbers of the amount of support, but uh, at the outset, uh, we uh, worked with the International Organization of Migration uh, to support their efforts um, to, uh, to integrate uh, uh, some of those who had been returned, but I, I'd okay. have to get back to you with the specifics. No our, problem. Our, our I, emphasis is on conditions in Haiti for the general population, as you know. Yes, no problem. That'd be, I would really appreciate that. So Haiti was rightly chosen as one of four priority countries that will receive dedicated resources through the Global Fragility Act. 
a bipartisan bill that aims to elevate peace building and conflict prevention. Both through the regular budget and under the Global Fragility Act framework, you're tasked with helping to provide U.S. assistance to a government that lacks credibility and has rampant corruption and ties with gangs that are perpetuating violence in Haiti. Do you expect you'll be able to spend newly appropriated dollars effectively and GFA specific funds effectively while the political situation remains extra constitutional? And which groups and parties are being consulted with in Haiti to ensure that GFA implementation is starting off on the right foot given the uh, difficult political situation in the country? Well, um, the announcement of the Global Fragility Act countries, the process that gave rise to it, all of that uh, took some time. The announcement is, in the scheme of the U.S. government, relatively recent. So uh, I don't think yet that we have um, a breakdown uh, or anything close to it on the, the organizations that we would be partnering with. But very much taking on board the premise of your question, about uh, the, the major legitimacy challenges around the current um, <laughs> political structures, um, you know, there are ways to support the cause of the Global Fragility Act that don't entail uh, working with the government, indeed working with uh, some of the very partners that you have in mind. And, and certainly, um, you know, as we see rampant gang violence and, and a level of uh, physical insecurity uh, for the Haitian people, I mean, where whole parts of the capital city now are, are, are deemed off limits, um, you know, there, there's plenty of work yeah. uh, to go around. But on, on the specifics, I think we're still developing that. I, I hope the consultation has been as broad as as you would uh, wish to see, but, but that's something I, I can be more specific on when I check in with our mission. Okay, great. So let me switch to migration. I was glad to see last year's announcement that USAID would be supporting the implementation of the Biden administration's root causes strategy and the collaborative migration management strategy to tackle migration in the Northern Triangle. I'd like to hear more about uh, how this work is developing a year on and specifically about how these strategies are focused on the unique needs of marginalized and particularly vulnerable groups. For example, we know that women and children on the move are uniquely vulnerable to gender-based violence. And we've heard stories about how racism impacts migrants, like the differential treatment Haitians received at the border, but throughout the region um, and at the southern border. So how does USAID's implementation of the root causes strategy address these unique and specific needs? And do you have adequate resources to do so effectively? Do you need any more help from us? Or you know, what's the situation there? Thank you. Well, I think there is a, a, a request in the 23 budget, very specific to this region, uh, asking for a ramp up of resources in keeping with President Biden's uh, four year plan, which he announced at the outset of his administration. I mean, I think, in, in, uh, it, not by way of caveat, because I, I don't like these kinds of caveats, but it, it is important context uh, that the decision to suspend assistance by the previous administration did impact 80, more than 80% of USAID's projects. And uh, many of them shut down entirely, people were laid off, so we, we are mm -hmm. still scaling up. Nonetheless, I think the vaccine distribution program has been uh, heroic, which reflects the, the kind of partnership with the ministries of health, uh, distributing uh, more than uh, 10 million vaccines, uh, reaching people with, um, uh, humanitarian assistance and creating tens of thousands of jobs. I can give you the breakdown per country. Um, but uh, I, I also draw your attention finally, briefly, sorry, Mr. Chair, uh, to the legal pathways. The H-2B announcement uh, was made yesterday, I believe, by the Department of Homeland Security. We are really beefing up our efforts to ensure that uh, individuals from Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala are part of that pipeline to pursue lawful migration to this country, because and they can also bring those resources back home. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, we'll now turn to Representative Ronnie Jackson of Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Administrator Pell, I would thank you for being here today. Um, I continue to be disappointed and unimpressed with the bike. On. Is your mic on, uh, on. Ronnie? On. Oh, over here. You know, try, yeah, maybe try another chair. How about that? Oh, perfect. All right. 
Well, thank you for being here today. Uh, I, uh, I'll, j I'll just uh, start over here. I, I continue to be a little bit disappointed and unimpressed with the Biden administration's foreign policy agenda. China's utilizing soft power diplomacy through COVID vaccine distribution and through the Belt and Road Initiative. Russia continues to attack Ukraine civilians and destroy its country. Iran is reportedly increasing its demands of the U.S. and our partners in the JCPOA, uh, JCPOA negotiations, which are actually still being proctored by Russia. Uh, closer to home, the southern border is facing a constant stream of record-breaking numbers of illegal immigrants and deadly drugs like fentanyl. Across all corners, global leadership is sorely needed, and the United States under the Biden administration is missing the mark, in my opinion. I hope that we see strong leadership and better policy coming from USAID and the State Department going forward. With that said, I just, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, you've said one of your biggest priorities is to break down the barriers to make it easier for different kinds of organizations to work with USAID. Last year, just 10 groups received over half of all the contract funding, uh, so there seems to be a limited opportunity for non-traditional partners to work with the agency. Uh, it can take more than a year for USAID to, USAID to, to vet a new partner. Uh, long timelines and red tape does and will discourage organizations, especially smaller organizations, from working with USAID. What specific steps are you taking to shorten this time to get new organizations vetted and improved? And also, what specific regulation changes could Congress make to speed this process up? Thank you so much for that question. Um, uh, so I think already Congress, through the New Partners Initiative and the Local Works Program, have created dedicated pools of funding in a sense where that funding can't be accessed unless and until it goes to local partners. Um, uh, I want to come back actually to your to your opening statement if I could if I have if I have a second. But um, the uh, I think that the we are uh, launching within USAID as a whole uh, a kind of desludging. Uh, anti-paperwork burdens, anti-administrative burdens uh, effort that is going to touch very much on the contracting process so that these 150-page uh, contracts, which disproportionately are going to uh, exclude the ability to work with local organizations, um, that those are not, again, the, the run of the mill. I, you know, some of the big contracts that you mentioned go to large humanitarian organizations that are operating in all the countries of the world. So there's some amount of that that I think is an important feature of American foreign policy, especially when it's branded as it is uh, with the World Food Program uh, and others. And then if I just may, may, may say uh, on vaccinating the world, which was just a part of your, your opening statement, I do think that has been a major uh, foreign policy success for this administration. You are seeing it uh, in the soft power uh, return that is evidence in polls, but above all, you're seeing it in people who've been inoculated, uh, thus reducing the risk of variants, not entirely. So I'm hopeful that the House and Senate will will give us additional resources to continue vaccinating the world, rather than saying on the one hand uh, that the PRC, you know, is out there doing vaccine diplomacy, and then uh, depriving us of the resources to do a job that is actually working for us and for the American people. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. I have one more quick question. Uh, I'm, sh I'm extremely concerned over the Biden administration's stance towards American energy as well. Our executive branch should be supporting and encouraging domestic energy production. Instead, the administration is shunning American oil and gas while simultaneously soliciting Venezuelan oil, for example. I was alarmed by reports of a directive sent to all embassies that no new money could support any project with fossil fuels overseas. I'm especially concerned with the potential effects on Power Africa that this policy change will have. As the world is looking for alternatives other than Russian oil and gas, the United States needs to be the country that others rely on for energy. Administrator Power, uh, in parts of the developing world where energy access is not wide, widespread, do you believe our priority should be combating energy poverty at all, you know, in any way we can, instead of imposing more restrictions on useful energy sources? Uh, I think Power Africa, you know, is proceeding to address energy poverty, recognizing, of course, that there are a lot of legacy programs um, and recognizing the need for base energy and so forth. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I, I, I think that right now we are not seeing our efforts to address energy poverty offset by the countries that we're working with interest in transitioning to renewables, which they believe are ultimately going to be cheaper for their people, and, and particularly off-grid installations of solar, hydro, et cetera, uh, that don't, don't uh, require as much uh, financial investment in infrastructure. Thank you, I appreciate your answers. My time is up, thank you, sir. Thank you, nice to see you again.
The chair, uh, chair recognizes Representative Sarah Jacobs of California and uh, praises her for her patience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, uh, Administrator Power, for uh, staying uh, for all of us to be able to ask questions. Um, you know, many of my colleagues have uh, discussed uh, what we've seen at Russia using hunger as a weapon of war and its invasion's impact on global food security. Um, it's why I introduced a bipartisan resolution recognizing the impact of conflict on global hunger and why I'm grateful for everything you and the administration are doing to address global food insecurity around the world. Um, I wanted to uh, talk with you about the Global Fragility Act. Last week, I chaired a foreign affairs subcommittee hearing on the implementation of the act, where in addition to state and DOD, assistant to the administrator Rob Jenkins testified on USAID's behalf. We discussed lessons learned on Mozambique and coastal West Africa, the resources most needed for successful implementation, and the importance of localization. So I first wanted to ask you about resources. I understand there is a deadline to use up FY21 funds. How does the administration plan to utilize these funds, and when can we be expected to be notified of this plan? You would think, given how long you'd waited, that I, I would make <laughs> absolutely sure I could answer your question. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm going to have to get back to you on that. No. I, don't, I don't actually, I know that, again, the country selection process, there were lively debates that took a long time on that. What I don't know is where we are on country planning. Okay, no problem. Um, then you may or may not know the, the answer to this, uh -oh. but um, the multi-donor global fragility fund uh, is right now included within the prevention and stabilization fund, despite the intent of GFA for the global fragility fund to be a separate and distinct fund. Um, I know state's not here uh, who uh, has some of the management of this funds, but I was wondering if you could speak to the justification for not seeking the creation of a distinct fund and how will you ensure implementation is not hindered and we're able to properly solicit contributions to the Global Fragility Fund? Um, I don't have the answer. I believe the answer, though, as you know, USAID's budget process kind of runs, it's collaborative uh, with the State Department, runs through uh, the State F Bureau. I, I think the logic of that from, from recall is some idea of integration and concentrating resources and being able to double down so we actually show a return. Um, but again, the specific logic and, and whether that's a, a yeah, I, I, don't, no I, don't, I don't have that. I'll give you one that you for sure can answer. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm running, <laughs> I'm losing confidence. No, here. all good. Um, I, you know, I know that localization has been a big priority of yours, and I really thank you for your leadership on that um, and for everything you're doing on locally-led development. We've heard in a bipartisan way, I think, today, somewhat surprisingly, how important that is to improve our development assistance. So I wanted to ask you, you know, how does USAID's reliance on a small number of large government contractors carry out to carry out its program um, impact our ability to be able to address the challenges we're facing? Um, and how can we reduce it, this reliance on large international government contractors as we look to increase the use of local experts and encourage um, local partners to really be in the lead of these programs? Well, this, this builds on Congressman Jackson's uh, question, as you said, uh, nicely. I mean, I think that you know, one would have to do a side by, you, you know, it's the counterfactual we never have, right, of what is the actual impact in a community of going through a local organization in the moment rather than something that might be multi-year and, uh, you know, bigger bigger sums at, at, at work as international organizations, you know, that might be their, their proposals might, might entail something that scales more easily. So, again, that counterfactual isn't available to us program by program, but what, what my biggest concern about the overweighting that both of you have referred to and the reason that we are making a, a hard push on this, including by trying to increase the number of individuals we have at USAID at our missions who can sit down side by side with local organizations and help them jump through the hoops that they have to jump through in order to contract or get a grant with USAID, because no matter, even if we desludge and reduce burdens, that's still, there's those requirements are still stringent for all the reasons that we also care about, reducing fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, but my biggest concern is not that side by side, it's, it's the lasting question of whether we are doing sustainable development. You know, whether these organizations, you know, we can say, well, it's costly in the here and now to make an investment in their accounting capability or in their ability, uh, you know, to, to, to meet these stringent requirements, but 
then these organizations don't get the resources, or maybe they're a, a sub-grantee, which, which would be progress, but is still not the same as being a grantee themselves, uh, and all that overhead exists in other organizations and all that accountability, but they then don't obtain uh, that internal infrastructure to do work over time. So when we close our missions, as we always hope to do, what have we left in our, in our place? And when those international organizations go away, yes, there'll be human capital that will have been trained, presumably as staff and, and as beneficiaries, uh, but, but it's not the same as, as really growing a country's ability to do that work by itself. Thank you. Thank you, I yield back. Chair recognizes Representative uh, Chrissy Houlihan of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for the opportunity to ask you questions. Um, can you hear me okay before I get started? Yes. Excellent. Um, I'm going to follow up on some of the conversation that you were having with Mr. Fluger a while ago. Um, he was asking questions about demand for sustainable energy as an example. But my uh, question will be more broad than that on uh, the role of capitalism uh, in, in growing our sustainable um, efforts worldwide. I, I co-chair the Stakeholder Capitalism Caucus uh, with a colleague, Dean Phillips, and we're aiming to promote equitable, inclusive, and sustainable private sector practices and investments. I'm also grateful to sit on, here on this Foreign Affairs Subcommittee, uh, a subcommittee on international development, international organizations, and global corporate social impact. Uh, I was attracted to that particular committee because of the global corporate social impact aspect of it. So I'm very, very interested in and invested in exploring the intersection between smart private sector investments and international development aligned with U.S. interests. For fiscal year 23, USAID requested $250 million for President Biden's Build Back Better World Initiative that would support development of high standard infrastructure and low and middle income uh, countries while collaborating with the private sector to support inclusive economic growth, to raise labor and environmental standards, and to promote transparency, governance, and anti-corruption measures. The administration has stated that the infrastructure development carried out in a transparent and sustainable manner, financially, environmentally, and socially, will lead to a better outcome for recipient countries and communities. You were mentioning in your conversation with Mr. Fluger about how many of our international communities are, are um, walking or talking with their feet, you know, and, and, and asking for things that they need independent of us pushing them. But I was wondering if you agree that the United States views on ESG criteria as a priority consistent with our national interest in the foreign affairs and international development space. I was wondering if you agree that these views are, are important, that ESG is a priority for us, not only domestically, but also globally as well. I, I believe that those are, are part of the, the standard process and that US, USAID is um, you know, attentive to those standards in, in the work that it does uh, running through potential projects through that prism, but also engaging governments so that they're sensitive to those uh, to those criteria and standards as well. So one of the things that I was wondering uh, beyond that is beyond the Build Back Better World Initiative, is your agency engaged in other collaborative partnerships that might help promote environmental, social, and governance standards that would be in line with the U.S. interests internationally as well? I, I think the, an the short answer is yes, uh, but getting you a lay down of that would require me to, to, uh, to get back to you. I'd like that, and I'd like to have, if it's possible, kind of a longer conversation about what we can be doing to harness the power of the for-profit economy and the for-profit sector, um, NGOs uh, not, uh, aside and governments aside and you know, foreign assistance and aid aside. The for-profit sector is just so powerful, and I think that it's um, catching on globally that this is something that we need to be thinking of in terms of our resources and dollars and partnering and would love to have a longer conversation about how we can work on that. With what's remaining of my time, I want to switch topics to uh, talking about UNFPA. I'm really grateful that the Biden-Harris administration has requested $56 million for UNFPA, which is, I think, a historical high. But I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on whether you believe meeting the protection and health needs of girls and women still remains a critical component to USAID's mission. Well, I think you'll you'll see from the the president's budget request, uh, which has in it uh, a historic uh, request to double um, gender uh, 
finance, uh, and that includes um, uh, you know, everything from reproductive health, uh, uh, maternal health, um, gender and, uh, excuse me, women and girls, uh, empowerment, microfinance for women, you know, it's, it runs the gamut, but absolutely women's health uh, is at the core of that programming. It's also what our, our public health bureau uh, recognizes. We, we've seen just in countries all over the world that the investments we make in uh, women's health, uh, in women's reproductive health, just have cascading benefits in all the other development sectors. Uh, so these investments are not only uh, the right thing to do, but of course, uh, a very, very wise, smart thing to do. And I appreciate that and would look forward with the remaining seconds that I have to welcoming any conversation you'd like to have with me or my office on how I can be helpful to engage USAID and UNFPA's uh, continued relationship. And with that, I yield back and appreciate the time. Thank you, Congresswoman. Chair now recognizes Representative Ken Buck of Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Administrative Power, I'm concerned and interested in your views on uh, aid to the Palestinian Authority, um, in particularly in light of the uh, documented uh, incitement of hatred and violence in the schools in uh, the Palestinian territory. Just wondering what your, your thoughts are on, on that. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Well, uh, to, to state what I hope is obvious, uh, any such incitement is abhorrent. Um, and de USAID's deputy administrator was actually just in the region and had the chance uh, to raise directly with Palestinian Authority officials um, uh, our concerns as an agency, but of course as an administration, as a country, uh, with everything from the pay to slay uh, program to uh, you know broader concerns about incitement um, our programming is in different domains. It's programming that is just restarting now after uh, a hiatus uh, brought about by the, the prior um, suspension. We're in very close touch uh, with the government of Israel on everything from water and sanitation projects that we might be able to do together to kind of community level peace building across the lines to core humanitarian assistance given the global food crisis. Uh, so most of the engagement on incitement uh, by our administration comes through diplomatic pressure of that nature. The State Department, not my agency, but uh, is the funder of UNRWA as well, where this question of incitement uh, also has arisen because of concerns about textbooks, and I know that's something that they press on uh, constantly. What, uh, what gains have we seen, what changes have we seen as a result of resuming uh, the aid? Well, I think that first we see uh, a lot of enthusiasm uh, on the part of uh, the government of Israel to resume this assistance out of concern about the destabilizing effects of cutting off assistance. Um, just the fundamental recognition that economic stability uh, plays a critical role. It's not the only factor, but behind um, uh, the kind of security uh, that everyone in the region uh, is craving for themselves. Um, with regard to the specific number of beneficiaries of people who've received, for example, our World Food Program humanitarian assistance, I'd have to get back to you uh, with the numbers. And I guess I'm more interested yep. in the uh, alignment of values than in specific numbers of, of uh, individuals that, that have benefited from the aid. Do we see uh, and it may be too early to, to make that kind of judgment, but do we see any sort of uh, movement in, in, in values? You know, I, I, it is very soon. I mean, we, we just, there were some congressional holds on last year's funding that got lifted quite late, and so some of that money is just getting obligated. Uh, MEPA, which is something that, that is named, of course, for Nita Lowy, uh, w was just created, and we have projects uh, that are going to involve peace building, you know, as I mentioned already, at, at the community level. You know, it's going to be very difficult to, you know, judge sort of a population as a whole and values, but what I can say is uh, that there was, you know, great sadness among some of the, for example, independent media that USAID had trained to, to see funding cut off when, when those journalists were actually exposing the very corruption that we as an administration were, were critical of. So over time, we hope to be in a position to diversify the kinds of uh, programs that we fund, you know, young women's organizations, the kinds of education 
uh, that has lasting effects. And you know, our programs all around the world, it would be true in community programs here in this country too, they operate kind of individual by individual. And, and I think that's where one would look uh, to see um, you know, a change in the view of the United States, but also above all a change in the welfare of the people uh, who we're engaging. So what, what um, policies are in, in place or procedures that will guarantee adherence to the Taylor Force Act and the uh, uh, making sure that money doesn't get into the wrong hands, that it is uh, strictly for humanitarian aid? Well, every um, obligation of funding, we, we uh, are you know, in consultation, uh, of course, with, with our mission on the ground and all of the vetting requirements that I alluded to earlier. We have little time, so I won't go back, back through them. But also with, uh, you know, our programs are, are now run out of our, of our embassy. Um, so, you know, Israeli officials have been consulted on a great number of them, including the COGAT, who my deputy administrator, our deputy administrator, met with on her, on her recent travels. But what I was starting to say is that in doing the congressional notification process as well, you all retain an ability to, to look at these programs. And uh, you know, when we have encountered concerns about uh, programs, about whether they are somehow close to the line, we have worked those concerns through with staff or we've adjusted programming. Uh, so I, I, I have uh, great confidence that we are adhering to the Taylor Force Act and will continue to do so. I thank you and I uh, yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Representative Kathy Manning of North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Administrator Power, for being with us for so long and for your service. One of the uplifting things that I have seen in my district during uh, Putin's terrible assault on Ukraine is the determination of Americans to find ways to help the Ukrainian people, those who stay in their country and those who have sought refuge in Poland and in Moldova. And there are a variety of individuals and nonprofit organizations in the triad area of North Carolina, my district, who are working to help deliver supplies to Ukrainian refugees, working with groups on the ground in Europe, such as the Jewish Community Center of Krakow. Are there ways that American nonprofit groups can partner with USAID to help deliver those supplies to those who need them in an organized fashion. I'd appreciate working together on this because I'm getting lots of calls from people and groups in my district. Thank you. Well, I think, you know, in the initial crush of the invasion, as, you know, Kyiv was under siege, including all the centralized, you know, government institutions, you know, I think, I think this was very, very challenging because, um, you know, you had you had uh, people uh, out of such generosity, you know, sending supplies to the border. They were backing up. Sometimes that was making it challenging for some of the, those very large humanitarian actors to get their uh, commodities in. I think now, as the Ukrainian government reconstitutes, um, you know, in Kyiv in mass. I mean, it, again, the, the core of the Ukrainian government, of course, remained. Uh, I think this is something that. Uh, our mission on the ground when we get back, because right now we're still in Poland, unfortunately, um, uh, very, very eager to be part of this vanguard of U.S. officials who go back. I think this question of how to facilitate is going to become easier to address. Our, our message up to this point, though, has been cash is best, which is a very, it's not a nice message because people want to mobilize strollers and uh, you know, teddy bears or, you know, hygiene products or that, you know, they want to do things that feel a little more personalized, but the cash really does help because it is the kind of thing that when it goes to a World Food Program or UNICEF, it can actually go directly into the bank account of a vulnerable uh, family that's been displaced. That's the kind of cash assistance programs that they run. It's not people's impression of what these international organizations do but it's definitely the preference of a family is to be able to decide for themselves um, you know, what to do with a, 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 a small uh, increment of cash that, that comes in. So my state of North Carolina has a long-standing relationship, partnership rather, with the country of Moldova. And my community in Greensboro has a long-standing partnership with the city of Belsey. So we have a particular interest 
in making sure that we are helping Moldova. And as you know, that country has welcomed the highest concentration of refugees per capita, which is a, a serious challenge for Moldova, not only because it's a small country, but it is a poor country. Has USAID taken stock of Moldova's needs, including ways that we can help upgrade hospitals and other infrastructure as they deal with the influx of so many people. And, and they've really welcomed the refugees, but it, it, is a, it is a burden on their country. Well, I've traveled actually to Moldova twice, and I'm so glad to know about your community's interest in Moldova. We should, we should talk more about that because I, I do think it's, it's kind of an unsung story in all of this, is, is that they have taken the highest number of per capita refugees. You know, many of those may have moved on eventually, but there's still you know, just shy of 100,000 refugees living in the country. Uh, I visited, it was just last month, and, and just saw uh, you know, these bed and breakfasts that used to be charging, you know, just letting people in uh, to stay, uh, wineries uh, you know, near the Ukrainian border uh, that, that used to be catering to tourists and others now just allowing displaced people. I mean, the generosity is off the charts. I think the other part of the unsung uh, or the untold story here is the leadership of that country, President Sandu, um, who you know is trying to uh, implement an anti-corruption agenda that's as ambitious as anything happening anywhere in the world, and doing so with Russian energy blackmail taking hold at the very same time. So what's really important, I think, about the supplemental that you previously passed, which created flexibility, and the supplemental that's now pending before the Senate is it actually puts us in a position, potentially if it goes through, to provide some direct budget support to Moldova when fuel prices are skyrocketing, uh, when there's a, 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 you know, a lot of political polarization where Russian media have really infiltrated the country through television primarily. Um, so there's a real chance to support Moldova at this critical inflection point, I think, in its trajectory, which wants to be an integrated trajectory west. Well, I appreciate your talkability, and I yield back. The chair now recognizes Representative Andy Barr of Kentucky for five minutes and maybe five seconds. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Administrator Power, um, thanks so much for your service. And, and uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting many of the, the staff that work USAID abroad, and they do great work. And, and please pass along our gratitude for their service. Uh, Square One Technologies is a company in my district that develops and manufactures a 14-stage advanced water treatment and purification system that can disinfect and sanitize dirty water much cheaper and better than widely adopted methods like chemical treatment or reverse osmosis. I know you're very familiar with water uh, challenges across uh, the undeveloped world. Um, uh, this company is interested in partnering with USAID to distribute their systems across Africa in particular to offer a solution to access clean water. For American companies such as Square One that employ hardworking Americans, how does USAID partner with those companies here in the United States uh, that may want to offer their technology or services abroad? Thank you. Um, we actually just set up a website called workwithusaid.org because so many had that question and weren't finding it, I gather, uh, all that easy to answer. So as a first port of call, I think that's where I would steer anybody interested in working with USAID. Um, but obviously, if your office wants to, to reach out, you know, just to have a better sense of what our water programs look like or, 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 and to pass that along on your side, um, you know, we're sensitive about procurement and wanting, you know, uh, there to be uh, uh, rigorous uh, procurement processes and, and transparent ones and all the like, but, but I think what we need to do is just simplify the procedure of informing people about w what it takes to work with USAID, uh, making sure that they know the deadlines, the requirements, et cetera. So my, my constituent at Square One has been waiting uh, for a reply from USAID's uh, water office um, um, to set up a call. C can, can you commit that we can hear by USAID in, in, in short order? Um, if, you, if your office will follow we'll work with give you us that information, that. yes, of course. Thank you very yeah, much. Of course, absolutely. Um, in 2021, USAID provided over $110 million to support development and humanitarian programs in the West Bank and Gaza, 
kind of as a follow-up to Mr. Buck's uh, line of questioning. In prior years, we have received reports from the Israeli government that U.S. tax dollars going to organizations purporting to be humanitarian in nature are actually being funneled to support the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement against the State of Israel. What partner vetting system does USAID use to make sure that U.S. tax dollars do not go to malign actors, particularly those who are participating in the BDS movement? Uh, thank you. I have not heard allegations that any of the funding you're referencing um, has gone to anything other than its intended beneficiaries. Again, if your staff can follow up and give, if there's anything specific there, um, you know, our vetting procedures are as stringent there uh, the, uh, as in any, any part of the world. Uh, there are uh, layers of vetting ahead of time, not only with the grantee, but any sub-grantee. Um, we also uh, do uh, compliance reviews after the fact uh, in terms of what our implementing partners have actually done to sort of go back over and make sure we're checking uh, any issues or any diversion on the back end. So yeah. again, if there's a specific, but um, it's, it's a very, very elaborate, in light of the sensitivities, in light of the risks mm -hmm. uh, there and in several other theaters, it's, it's again the most uh, stringent vetting. And shifting away from BDS, but back to Taylor Force and Taylor Force compliance, um, while there may not be direct assistance to the PA, there is concern that the spirit of Taylor Force is being circumvented by uh, partnering with organizations, NGOs, uh, that may be uh, making those martyr payments to, um, um, uh, in lieu of the PA directly. Um, and we don't, we obviously don't want any U.S. tax dollars funneled through NGOs uh, that operate to circumvent Taylor Force. Can you speak to that? Um, again, if you have any specifics where, where there's a concern that that is happening, uh, I would definitely uh, like to hear those. I just, the, the nature of the projects that we are doing, the extent of the conversations we are having with members up here in the MEPA context, the composition of the board that we have where the ranking and majority of, of all our oversight committees and others uh, were able to put forth board members. Um, I, I really think we have the infrastructure in place to, to guard against diversion. And, and final question on, on China and the Pacific. Um, what, what work is USAID doing with other development arms like uh, DFC to accomplish American foreign policy goals, specifically countering Belt and Road? Um, I'm especially interested in Oceania, Indo-Pacific. Um. <laughs> I'm going to have to, yeah, it's an important question, but maybe if uh, you can follow up uh, directly. Um, the chair now recognizes Representative Juan Vargas of California for five minutes, and then we have just one more and we'll be done. Until somebody else much. arrives. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Sorry. Chair. Uh, Ambassador, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. I apologize that I wasn't able to hear the entirety of your comments, there was another hearing that I also was uh, involved in. Um, but there are so many questions, the invasion of Ukraine, uh, you know, Afghanistan, uh, Yemen, northern Ethiopia, but I'd like to focus in on something you said, and that is everyone deserves food. Everyone deserves food. The insecurity that we see right now, especially because of Ukraine, really concerns me. Um, I, I think I've asked you before about David Beasley. I, I know you know who he is, and he has talked to us before and was going to talk because we had to cancel his hearing, but of the, the severe problem that we have and how it's getting worse because of what's happening in Ukraine and Russia. Could, um, could you comment a little bit of how you interact with the World Food Program that he runs and, and what we can do? Because I, I, I think it's horrible that so many people are marching towards starvation when, again, everyone deserves food. Well, exactly, and uh, with world food prices up as high as 34% from last year, um, you know, for all of the incredible generosity of the American people who have really stepped up, um, not only through the Congress, but on their own, you know, contributing to organizations who are trying to help meet food needs, um, the the needs are just outpacing the resources that are being dedicated to this. So we are grateful for the humanitarian assistance uh, that uh, is provided for in the second Ukraine supplemental, which is not confined uh, to, to funding humanitarian needs inside Ukraine or for Ukrainians. It also uh, speaks to the need to meet uh, the, the needs stemming from the fallout from the war. 
Um, but this food crisis, as David Beasley has been uh, the, the, the first to say up here for, for almost a year, well predated uh, the, the uh, decision by Putin to, to recklessly invade Ukraine. And I think what we are trying to do is to combine this kind of stopgap humanitarian assistance through WFP and other humanitarian actors, uh, and WFP is our main, as USAID, is our main provider of humanitarian assistance globally, but to combine that with um, engagement you know, at the field level uh, on the kinds of inputs and drought resistant, heat resistant seeds, uh, building on the Feed the Future program, but taking the additional food security money, which is apart from the humanitarian assistance, to try to make sure that farmers are using the precious fertilizer that they have in the most efficient way possible, that they're supplementing it with organic if they can, uh, just to try to be able to get more yield, uh, that countries like Zambia that make wheat uh, when there is a wheat need in the neighborhood are able to export more of their supplies. And we're also engaging on the export bans that have been put in place because those are, are really gonna hurt the global food supply, the global grain supply, along with what Putin is preventing from being exported out of Ukraine. Well, well thank you for working on that. And again, I, I hope that relationship's a good one because I think it's very important to work with the World Food Program. You'd have um, to ask him, right. but, but on my side, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very productive relationship. Uh, I'm a big uh, fan and, well, and his well, energy well. is made for this moment and his entrepreneurship. I've only heard good things about you with one exception, and I'll say I'll tell you the exception. I was very happy to hear your comments the last time, and then I spoke to my daughter, who's at the Harvard Law School, and she said, wait a minute, he, she's married to Cass Sunstein. I can't get in his class. I guess he's too busy. But anyway, putting that aside, that's the only negative thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and that isn't even me. But um, what, I, what I do want to uh, say is this. I'm very grateful that you said something about the vaccine, because I've been one of those ones that have been pushing for us to spend more on that internationally. And the people who are against it and vote against it then say, look what Russia's doing, look what China's doing, and we look awful because we're not helping when they vote against putting money in for these international vaccines. So I'm glad you spoke up. I mean, I think that that's so important to, to comment. I don't, I don't have much time here, but I I do want to uh, thank you. I do think you're doing an excellent job, the, the, the scope, the breadth of what you need to do, the depth, and I think you're doing a great job. Work, work, uh, continue to work hard as you're doing. I think you're doing very well. Thank you. We're proud of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congressman. And I'll, I'll talk to Professor Sunstein about his poor selection process. Uh, but on the vaccines, just to say, it, you know, it hasn't come up that much in this hearing, and yet we could look back on this period with such regret if we don't find the resources to continue vaccinating the world. Regret for the reasons that you say in terms of who else will step in to fill the breach, but also regret because when immunocompromised people get COVID, the risks of new variants and mutations that ultimately imperil Americans uh, you know, really increases. And, and it would just be horrific to look back and, and think there were things we could have done, but we didn't um, because of whatever, whatever the, 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 the logic is, uh, you know, because it didn't seem a good investment at the time. We have to plan ahead and know uh, that uh, this is about prevention of something much worse. From saving the world to getting a kid in class, congressional <laughs> oversight works. Uh, so finally, um, last but certainly not uh, least, I, uh, I will recognize Representative Brad Schneider of Illinois. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to thank uh, you and Chairman Minks for having this hearing and uh, uh, Administrator Power. Thank you uh, for uh, spending time with us and, and staying uh, so I had a chance to, uh, to ask a question. Um, as you touched in, you also said in your testimony, we face mammoth problems in the world, uh, world that uh, problems that the U.S. can't solve alone, but that the world can't solve without U.S. leadership. And I'm grateful for the work you're doing, that you're in your position to do that, and, and the leadership that uh, the United States uh, is showing. Uh, you touched on it with your comments about uh, vaccines, and we know that if uh, we don't get it right, the consequences can be uh, significant, uh, not just for the United States, but globally, but it's true on so many issues. Uh, and uh, before I go on, I, I wanna touch on, on the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, uh, and I am grateful again 
for American leadership, for the administration, what Congress has done in ensuring that we're delivering critical security, economic, and humanitarian assistance. American leadership in this case has to be steadfast, and we must continue to demonstrate uh, not just to Vladimir Putin and Russia, but to, to the world that uh, we will remain un uh, united uh, with our allies and not just stopping Russia's uh, unprovoked illegal uh, invasion, but reversing it and securing uh, Ukraine's sovereign future and helping the Ukrainians uh, rebuild their country. Um, I also, I know we've talked a lot about it over the course of, uh, of this hearing, uh, turning to the Middle East. Uh, two years ago, uh, Congress uh, passed and, and authorized the Needle Lowy Middle East Partnership for Peace. And we've touched on some of those programs, and you've talked about making sure that we adhere to the Taylor Force Act and, and make sure none of that money goes to uh, people who um, are, are given incentives by the PA uh, to commit uh, grievous acts of terror uh, in Israel. Uh, but the, the uh, MEPA program is, is, is critically, critically important. Uh, it focuses on people-to-people -people, um, interactions, creating the prospects for peace between two peoples, uh, creating the situation that hopefully will lead to a better future. Now, I know we've talked about the three USA grants that um, have so far been issued, um, and uh, there are second uh, solic solicitations. Uh, I am proud to have supported uh, MEPA, and I'm pleased to see these grants being put out. But as we get to the end of this hearing, can you talk a little bit more about some of the uh, successes we've seen, but also where investments are going, uh, and at the risk of uh, repeating what others have asked, how these are setting the, the path? You know, I, I'm uh, the chair of one of the chairs of the Abraham Accords Caucus here in Congress, uh, proud to have uh, introduced and, and we passed the uh, Israel Relations Normalization Act. We know that the path and prospects to peace are creating uh, opportunities on the ground and how MEPA and the work of USAID can help us do that. Um, well, I, I mean, I guess because it is a little bit early days, I would just speak to the relative enthusiasm. Um, uh, and I, you know, I've talked a lot about the consultations we've done uh, on the Israeli side, but I think at the, at the community level, um, uh, in the, the Palestinian territories, the desire to see America back, um, funding these programs out and about. I think, uh, you know, we're talking about um, support to battle a pandemic. I mean, this is, this is meeting people at, at an hour of, of, of such need. We're talking about uh, water and sanitation projects that we're trying to pursue, and, and those are challenging. And again, given the Taylor Force Act, we are absolutely uh, determined um, and, uh, to, you know, stay within the confines of the law, and so making sure uh, that the projects that, that we do provide material benefit in communities without uh, having any 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 benefit to the PA um, is is so important. So, you know, I think it's going to be exciting to see those projects launch. The the three that have been um, announced so far, um, I think. Uh, the the you know getting the two communities together you know isn't easy uh, given the other um, challenges you know the absence of uh, a visible peace process and so you know much as we would like you know again the bottom up programming to give rise to a different kind of climate sometimes the the current climate and the divisions there you know make it harder to do some of this work but. Uh, but I think that once these projects are out and about and people see um, the resources available, you know, for this kind of community interaction, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to, to really scale some of what we're doing uh, so far. Well, I thank you. I'm, I'm convinced that uh, the uh, investment in, in people to people programs can make a difference. Uh, the U.S. leads best when we lead with our values and, and demonstrate them by uh, supporting people, but also making clear that uh, we will oppose uh, terrorism and, and violence. So uh, again, I thank you. I'm ex extended past my time. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I yield back. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Administrator, thank you for being willing to spend this much time with us, giving every member of this committee uh, a chance to interact with you. Um, that is uh, greatly appreciated on both sides of the aisle. and. Uh, and I think um, speaks well of your commitment to um, making the Congress a full partner in your efforts. Um, I, I will just refer back to, uh, in closing, something that Congressman Vargas 
um, said to you. We are, uh, all of us here uh, on both sides of the aisle, uh, eager to see the United States compete with China, um, deal with the threat posed by Russia, and yet many of us uh, don't seem to feel the same sense of urgency when it comes to giving you the resources to do that. Um, we have the capacity, America has the capacity to feed the world. We have the capacity to save millions of lives around the world um, through a vaccination program, and a shot of Pfizer costs a lot less than a cruise missile. Um, and we could actually do those things if our foreign assistance budget was, say, as great as it was 40 or 50 years ago, the last time we had a great power adversary in the world. That's not a crazy goal, to simply do what we did the last time we faced a situation like this. Um, I know you're a champion of that. I know you're a good steward of these programs. Um, and um, I hope all of us will continue to do everything we can to support you and give you the resources that, uh, that you need, uh, even if you don't help our kids get into a class at Harvard. So with that, the hearing is adjourned. <laughs>